Uh, this one? Or the other way? Yeah. Okay. You don't have to. You don't have to. Okay. So after I bring uh, Imam Shadid on, I'm gonna um, click my camera off. It'll look like this. Say? It'll look like this. That's fine. All right. Um, Dr. Leo, when you do your thing, just uh, talk a little bit louder. Okay. Welcome everybody on social media. Bismillah, uh, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, those of you that are on uh, Instagram and Facebook Live, alhamdulillah, welcome to our program this afternoon. Uh, we'll be talking about the roles, responsibilities, and rights of husbands and wives within the construct of marriage, inshallah ta'ala. And here again, this uh, lecture is hosted by the Philadelphia Free Library. I'm grateful to be a part of this uh, endeavor. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places much barakah in it for us all, and that we can all learn and benefit and grow and be inspired from the information that is going to be disseminated. So. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to thank everyone uh, for coming out to the In the Path of Islam lecture series. And this lecture series project is made possible in part by the Institute of the Museum and the Library Services of the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. And there's a grant from the Gladys Crimble Dallas Foundation. Imam Shadid Muhammad will be our speaker today. And Imam Shadid is a graduate from the prestigious Islamic University of Medina in Saudi Arabia. Imam Shadid graduated in 2007 with a bachelor's degree in the college of, from the College of Hadith with a concentration of Hadith sciences prophetic traditions, and he also holds an equivalent degree in the Arabic language from the same university. Since graduating, Imam Shadid has been involved in Islamic education and outreach on multiple levels using a multitude of platforms. He has lectured at many mosques, Islamic centers, colleges, and universities throughout America and abroad using classical Islamic teachings infused with a cultural context that appeals to Muslims across a multitude of spectrums and cultures. In addition, Imam Shadid established his own company, Rawda Publications, LLC, and has authored a total of eight books to date. He has a production company under the same name, Rawda Productions, LLC, that has produced an online talk show called the Mardia Show which tackles many contemporary issues in the American Islamic community. Currently, Imam Shadid is the Imam of Rolda Islamic Center of Delaware. He conducts a series of private online courses that blends Islamic teachings with social psychology, which tackles many contemporary issues within American Muslim diaspora. Imam Shadid's lectures can be found on his YouTube channel, Shadid Muhammad, as well as his Islamic daily posts, which can be found on his Facebook page, Shadid Muhammad forward slash Ralda Administration, in addition to his Instagram and Twitter pages. Today's lecture is titled, Spousal Rights in Islam, The Rules of Engagement. Marriage is a divine institution replete with guidelines, rules, and regulations designed to give man and woman the healthiest human engagement. Marriage in the Islamic tradition is governed by a set of broad spousal rights for both husband and wife 
that provides the skeleton for their engagement while allowing the individual capacity for love, emotional intelligence, and personal sacrifice to provide the clothing for that skeleton. Allah says in the Quran, which means, and from among his signs is that he created for you spouses from yourselves, that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between your hearts love and compassion. Indeed, in this is a sign for people who reflect. This is from the Holy Quran, Surah 30, Ayat 21. Imam Shadi. Jazakallah khairan for that. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-lambiyahi wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban wa amalan salihan mutakabbala. O Allah, we ask you for beneficial knowledge. Ilman nafi'an. And we ask you for vast provision or provision that will be sufficient for us. Rizqan tayyiban. We ask you for righteous deeds that will be accepted by you. Allahumma ij'alna mimman idha u'ti a shakar, wa idha b'tuli a sabar, wa idha adnaba istaghfara. O Allah, make us from amongst those when they are given, they are grateful. When they sin, they seek your forgiveness. And when they are tested, they are patient. These are the three levels of success in this life as well as in the hereafter. So alhamdulillah, I'm going to begin just a little bit to talk a little bit about the um, introduction to what it means, what is marriage from an Islamic context. Um, I, I need you guys to just kind of stay with me because um, so many things within the Muslim community get convoluted. We lose a lot of things in translation simply because there's just a plethora of information that is just flooded on social media and people are just receiving information from everywhere. And some of the things that I'm going to say, you may have heard before. And some of the things I'm going to say that I'm sure that you never heard before within the context that I'm going to mention it. Uh, and it's very important that we preserve this institution, meaning the institution of marriage, because if we don't, then we are opening up the doors where fornication and adultery just becomes commonplace within the Muslim community. And the Prophet Wasallam said no group of people who had been, had been given to fornication and adultery and debauchery and, you know, indecency, which is done prevalent within that community, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them with all types of diseases, tests them with all types of, um, um, tests them with all types of diseases and punishments. And we don't, we don't want that for our ummah. We don't want to, you know, bring that upon ourselves. So inshallah ta'ala, we want to do our best to make sure that we preserve this institution of marriage. Am, am I still on? Because I saw it go off and then it came back on. Am I on? I don't see you. Okay. I put your um hotspot on. I don't know. It does this sometimes. The internet here is not that great. Let me see. Let me just use my um just leave it to my you back. Okay, cool. I'm just gonna use the Wi Fi. I mean uh use just use my service inshallah. Okay, so stay with me inshallah Tyler. One of the beautiful aspects, one of the most beautiful aspects of the religion of Islam is the legislation of an institution that is designed to preserve the love and compassion that men and women find with each other within the construct of marriage. As the ayah that he mentioned uh, earlier from Surah number 30, Ayah 21, Surah Turum, Ayah 21, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and from amongst his signs is that he has created for you men from amongst yourselves mates, spouses, that you may find peace and tranquility in them. And he has placed between you love and compassion and indeed in that is a sign for people who reflect. Marriage in Islam is considered a moral safeguard and a social building block. Two key components that we need to understand about marriage. That marriage is a moral safeguard. This is one of the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to preserve our morality. It's a moral safeguard. 
This is why the Prophet Sallallahu instructed the, the young men in his community to get married. He said, Ya ma'ashara al-shabab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'a fal yatazawwaj. Fa'innahu agaddu lil-basar wa ahsanu lil-faraj. Wa min lam yastati'a fa'alihi bisawm fa'innahu lahu wijah. He said, O group of young men, whoever from amongst you has the ability to get married, then let him do so. Why? Because it is greater, it is more likely to cause you to lower your gaze. وَأَحْسَنُ لِلْفَرَجِ And preserve your chastity. Here again, marriage is a moral safeguard. That getting married, especially for young men, um, this wasn't something that women during that time necessarily had to worry about. Because there was only a certain class of women who were, you know, given to indecency and immorality. The vast majority of women, you know, from the upper tiers of society, they didn't engage in that because it was just simply, un it was unbecoming of a woman to engage in that, right? Which is why when ancient Jibreel first approached Medium as a young, as a man, he's in the form of a man and he approaches Medium. And the first thing she says to him is, you know, I seek refuge with Ar-Rahman, the most merciful from you, if in fact you are God-fearing. Don't approach me like this. And when she brought the child, when she brought Jesus to her family, they immediately accused her of indecency. And she said that, they said to her that your father wasn't known to be a man that was given to lewdness or indecency, nor was your mother. So that was something that was known during that time that women didn't engage in that. So this is why the address of the Prophet Sallallahu was initially to the young men in the community. There is nothing that is more dangerous to a community that is striving to be righteous like bachelorhood. Young men walking around the community single. And of course, when we're talking about young men, we're talking about um, idle time. We're talking about increases and in, uh, increased levels of testosterone. We're talking about all of the elements, all of the components, uh, all of the ingredients that lead to indecency and immorality. Um, and so the Prophet Sallallahu he said, O group of young men, whoever from amongst you has the ability to get married, then let him do so. It will cause you to lower your gaze, you know, not to gaze lustfully at women, and it will cause you to preserve and protect your chastity. And whoever does not have the ability to get married, then let him fast every other day because that will serve as castration, meaning it will cut off the desire. So marriage is a moral safeguard. And it is also a social building block. This is the way we build communities. We build communities through marriage. We do not build communities through bringing children into the world illegitimately. That's not how we build communities. That's how you destroy communities. Because those children will not feel a sense of belonging because the child was born illegitimately, number one. Number two, if the father doesn't stick around to honor that child and take care of that child, then the child is going to feel like there's a piece of him or her missing. And then that within itself creates a void within their life that they usually fill with, you know, behaviors that are destructive to society. This is why young men join gangs. This is why young boys join, you know, uh, ISIS and terrorist groups and things like that. There was a study done amongst young boys who join gangs, young boys who uh, join terrorist organizations like ISIS and ever and, and other groups. And the common thread between all of those young boys was an absentee father. Absolutely. So bringing children into the world illegitimately does not build society does not build communities it helps to destroy communities so marriage is a moral safeguard a social building block upon which the foundation of healthy communities and societies are built something that is inherent even within animals Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 6 ayah 38 and there is no living creature on earth or a bird flapping its two wings in the sky, except that they are comprised of communities just like you, even amongst animals. And then to ensure the longevity of this sometimes very complicated relationship between man and woman, the legislation of Islam has established guidelines, rules, regulations that places both husband and wife in their respective role and guards that role. It insulates that role with rules, regulations, and responsibilities. And so what we have in today's time are men and women who may want to get married or want to be in relationships, but they don't necessarily want the whole institution. 
There's a very famous quote by a woman named Mae West where she said, marriage is a beautiful institution, but I am not necessarily in uh, interested in the institution. Meaning, I want the luxury of, you know, the, 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 the man and woman relationship, but I don't want the burden of the institution that comes along with it. Right? I want to be irresponsible. I, I, don't, I don't want the responsibility of the institution. Marriage is a beautiful institution. I'm just not interested in the institution. I just want to be in a relationship without all the rules and regulations and roles and responsibilities. And that is pretty much where we are in today's time with the Muslim youth. Muslim youth want to be married, but they don't want the responsibility that comes along with the role that they take. A woman wants to get married and she still wants to be a boss. She still wants to be the CEO. She still wants to hang out with her friends unrestrictedly without any guidelines, rules, regulations, or to have to answer to anyone. And anytime a man tries to you know, assert himself in that regard... He is completely ridiculed. He's completely, you know, accused of being controlling, con accused of being, you know, uh, you know, abiding by antiquated roles that no longer serve a purpose in this life, in this day and time. And vice versa with women. When women try to hold men accountable to the standard that Islam has already set for them, and that is to be the provider, protector, maintainer of his family. Sometimes the men want to be irresponsible and they don't necessarily want the responsibility that comes along with that role, although they want the accolades of being a husband. It doesn't work like that. You don't get to have the role. You don't get to have the title without the rules and responsibilities that come along with it. You can't have one without the other. So to ensure the longevity of this sometimes complicated relationship the legislation of Islam has established guidelines, regulations, rules, and responsibilities that places both husband and wife in their respective roles. These roles, although viewed by many as traditional and sometimes antiquated with respect to the ever-changing environment that we live in, were intended to give husband and wife a more definitive trajectory towards the goal of marital bliss. You cannot reach marital bliss without some type of discipline. Without some types of, you know, regulatory rules and guidelines, you can't get there without it. Even if you manage to arrive there, you know, on your own, you know, by using whatever, you know, uh, uh, methods that you choose to use, it will only be short lived. It will only be temporary. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what God is offering us is an absolute solution, absolute system that is guaranteed if you if you abide by it. Guaranteed to provide you with that marital bliss that you're looking for. This is a sure shot, a sure system. But we can't work the system. We got to let the system work for us. You can't convert to Islam or you can't decide to start practicing Muslim, practicing Islam on your terms and work the system. It doesn't work like that. You got to let the system work for you. God knew what he was doing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what he was doing when he legislated this. So. These rights um, were systematically allocated to both husband and wife within the construct of marriage in a manner that is congruent with the diversity of their gender, their capabilities, and their individual obligations towards one another. So three things when we're looking at the roles and responsibilities and the rights of the husband and wife, those things right, are based upon a number of things. Number one, based upon gender. The husband, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرَكَ الْأُنْثَى The male is not like the female. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a clear distinction between men and women in Islam. And he obligated and legislated rules and responsibilities based upon those genders. The male is not like the female. Alright? You guys follow me? So the roles and responsibilities and guidelines that we have in relation to marriage are number one based upon gender. So this whole idea that we're all equal and, you know, you got to do what I got to do. And I, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَهُ وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَّ درجة. That women have the same rights, similar rights to the rights that are against them, but the men have a degree above them. So they are not on the same level. As a matter of fact, the Prophet وسلم, said, لو كنت آمرا أحد أن يسجد لأحد لأمرت المرأة أن تسجد لزوجها That if I was going to command another human being to prostrate to another human being, I would command a woman to prostrate to her husband. Out of the, 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 the great responsibility that she has towards him. That does in no way, shape, form, or fashion decrease or diminish 
the huge responsibility that the man has towards his wife. Uh, but it also highlights that the, the man and the woman, they're on the same level, but the men have a degree above them in terms of the responsibilities that the women owe to their husbands. And this is especially true if the husband is meeting the requirements of being a husband. It's one thing when the husband is slacking in his role and his responsibility. The woman may have some level of justification. But when the man is stepping up to the plate and fulfilling his role as a husband, the exact way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded to him, the more he obeys Allah, the more she is obligated to obey her husband. You follow me? And so here in Islam, the good guy always goes first. They have a saying in, in Jahiliya, the, the, the good guy always wins last or the, the good guy always wins last. And, and the good guy always gets a bad rap, you know, in society. The guy that's going to come in and do right. He's usually the last choice of a woman. Right. In high school, the woman wants to be with the jock. She wants to be with the star football player. She wants to be with the basketball player. You know, in her early 20s, she's go through this princess phase where she believes that she's God's gift to any man walking on earth. She can have any man that she wants. And then when reality kind of sets in, she's had some, you know, some disappointments in life and life has threw her a few curveballs that she was not prepared for. Then at the end of that road, she starts to realize and starts to set her sight on the good guy, the guy that's going to stick around, the guy that's going to have the babies and stay there and help parent and father with the children, then she decides, all right, I'll, I'll give him a shot, right? And there are many men that can testify to that right now, that you were not the first choice. There are many men who have pursued women throughout their lives and the woman, no, no. And then at some point, the light bulb went off in her head and she said, all right, I'll give you a shot. But that was after a long line of horrible experiences with men that didn't value them. In Islam, the good guy should be always the first choice. Right? When Fatima bint Qais came to the Prophet Sallallahu and she said, um, you know, Muawiyah proposed to me and Abu Jahm proposed to me. Which one should I marry? Here's a woman. She got options. Two men proposed to me. I got options. Which one should I choose, O Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Amma Muawiyah, fa sa'iluk la malala. He said, as for Muawiyah, he's poor. He doesn't have any money. Don't marry him. Life's going to be rough for you if you marry a man without money. For women that's listening, I'm telling you, marrying a man that doesn't have any money or struggling financially currently, life is going to be rough. And depending on where the woman is in her life experiences, she already can foresee that this is going to be a struggle and she opts out of that. No, I'm good. <laughs> and there's some women who are willing to take that leap because they can see potential in you. They know that this is just a temporary stage for you in your life, but you're on to greater things. So I'm willing to make that sacrifice. But there's some women who are not wise enough to see the end at the beginning. That's hikmah. That's wisdom. Being able to see the end at the beginning. And there's some women who lack that. They can't see the end at the beginning. So they look at the beginning as the end and they tell the man, nah, I'm good. And then lo and behold, you know, five, six, seven years from now when the guy is doing okay financially, he's an entrepreneur, got his own business, multiple streams of income. Now it's like, you know, hey, so, you know, are you married? You looking for marriage? It's like, oh, now I'm an option, right? Now I'm an option, you know. SubhanAllah. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, as for Muawiyah, for Sa'iluk la malala. He said, as for Muawiyah, Muawiyah is poor. Don't marry him. He said, Amma Abu Jaham for Nisa. He said, as for the other guy, Abu Jaham, he beats his women. Don't marry him either. So although Muawiyah, you know, young man, handsome, you know, he looked a little bit like the Prophet وسلم, He was, you know, very handsome. You know, he was the son of Abu Sufyan, one of the chiefs of Quraysh, and he converted to Islam. You know, he was he was desirable from that regard. And then you had Abu Jaham, you know, who not much mentioned about him, but obviously he had some desirable qualities, but he used to abuse that by beating on his women. And although they were the choice, the Prophet Sallallahu did not choose them. He said, marry Usama ibn Zayd, who was the son of Zayd ibn Haritha, a servant, a slave, who started off at the beginning of his years with the Prophet Sallallahu as a slave. And his son Usama also you know, the son of a slave. He had to carry that title with him. 
He had to carry that title. And so while not necessarily the first choice for her, he was the first choice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You understand? And so, you know, we have to, you know, reprioritize. We got to recalibrate our prioritization. And so these rights that were given to both husband and wife were systematically allocated to both spouses within the marital construct in a manner that is congruent with the diversity of their gender, with their capabilities, as you will see that the rights are usually based upon what you have the ability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not impose the specifics of the rights on the man or the woman. He gives the general rule of the right and then the degree to which the right is fulfilled is based upon individual capability. Allah uses the word ma'roof in the Quran. He said, as for the man that is the father of the child, since we're on Father's Day here, the father of the child, he should provide for the child based upon ma'roof, based upon his capability. Whereas in here in society, the judge, the woman takes him to child support. The judge decides based upon your income here, here, um, you have to pay X amount of thousand dollars a month for one child, two children. Totally overlooking, you know, the basic needs that this man needs to move on with his own life. And you have some men right now who are living only to provide for two, three, four children from, you know, from an ex-spouse. And they have barely anything for themselves, anything to move on with their lives. And the woman is just taking, 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 even though she doesn't need it. And every dime that you take beyond what you need, you will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for on your muqiyama. Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she complained. She said, Abu Sufyan, rajilun shahih, he is a stingy man, extremely stingy. And he doesn't give me what is sufficient for me and my, and my child. He's stingy. She's complaining to the Prophet Wasallam the same way that a woman would go to court today and complain about the, the father of her child not giving her any support money. Right? The same thing. But listen to the Prophet Wasallam's response. She said, Abu Sufyan is a stingy man. He doesn't give me what is necessary, what I need for me and my child. Baseline needs, basic necessity. You understand? And the Prophet Wasallam said to her, min malihi ma yakfiki wa walidik. He said, take from his wealth what is sufficient. What is sufficient. Yani ma al haja. What satisfies the need that you have. Without going beyond that. Take what you need from his wealth, what is sufficient for you and your child. You're going to take $18,000 a month for one child? $40,000 a month for one child? Regardless of how much the man makes, you say, okay, it's, it's commensurate based upon or proportionate to how much this person makes. Yeah, but we're still talking about the child. So then if, then if you're taking proportionately based upon what I make for my child a month, then it's not about the child. You follow me? It's not about the child at that moment. Because one child does not need $18,000 a month. So it's not about the child at that point. It's about the maintenance of the woman's lifestyle. A lifestyle that is usually was usually provided for her by the man that she was married to. And once that marriage dissolved, you don't get to continue maintaining that life based upon the, you know, the, the energy that this man puts forward to, you know. And this is one of the reasons why I was reading through a blog, man, subhanAllah. This is one of the reasons why many young men don't have any interest in marriage. I saw a man's comment on one of these blogs. Somebody shared with me. I saw, I'm, I like to read through the comments. I, I don't really focus on necessarily what's, what's in the entertainment part of the post. I immediately go to the comments because I want to see where people's, where their minds are. And I saw a young man who posted underneath the comment, why in the world would I get married and give half of everything that I worked for, for a, to a woman who probably only married me for the money anyway? Why would I do that? Why would I go into a marriage, make a commitment to a woman, and here I am working 
working hard and I developed all of this. It's different when a woman married you with nothing and helped you build that. That's something different. I believe in that case, she's entitled to half of what you have because half of what you are is as a result of what she invested. She's a partner. 50-50. But if the man was already developing himself and developing his business and was a successful entrepreneur and then marries a woman and she comes in and just reaps the benefit from that and then even after divorce, she takes half of that or portion of that or majority of that. This is, it's not about the child anymore. It's about maintaining your lifestyle. Nonetheless, it's about capabilities, gender, and individual obligation. Marriage, you know, was a source of prestige in the early Islamic community. All right. People sought out marriage because marriage gave people this level of prestige and honor within society. If you were walking around single, you were seen as, you know, you got subpar treatment. You, you single. And even now, this is something as many people who know, especially brothers who know me personally. This is exactly the way like I clown you if you're single. It, what all pun intended. Because why are you single? Just had a conversation with a young man the other day. Yesterday, as a matter of fact. Why are you single? Oh, no, I'm not ready for marriage. And as soon as he opened that door, boom, I'm there. After the conversation, you start rethinking, like, maybe I need to rethink this. You know. Marriage was seen as a sign of prestige and honor in the early Islamic community. One of the early scholars of Islam, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said about one of his contemporaries, Bishop Ibn Hadith, was another scholar who lived during that time, and uh, he died. And Imam Ahmed said about him that he would have been unrivaled by any other imam or scholar during this time if he had only gotten married before he died. The only thing that slighted him in comparison to all of the other scholars of his time is the fact that he died single. They saw that as like a, a nux, as a deficiency in your manhood. While today men walk around pridefully. No, I'm not married. I'm not interested in getting married. And just because you say you're not interested in getting married doesn't mean that you are not interested in being in a relationship with a woman. So that means that when you say I'm not interested in getting married, that you have already made reservations that fornication or adultery in the event that you have been married before, adultery and fornication, are totally, you're totally fine with that. You see the problem with that? And Umar bin al-Khattab, who he saw a young man and inquired as to the man's marital status. Are you married? And the young man replied that he was single. And Umar said to him, you are either too lazy to do what it takes to get married, or you're already in engaged in an unlawful relationship. Those are the only two reasons that you wouldn't be married. You are either too lazy to do what it takes to get married, or you're already involved in a haram relationship. And so therefore, you have no desire to get married. Now, I know that some men listening and say, well, you know, what about a man who's just celibate and, you know, he has no desire to be involved with a relationship in this society? In this environment? You, you want me to believe that? Maybe for a short period of time. I was, I was single when I first took my Shahada. I was single for two years. It was the worst two years of my life. I don't ever want to be single again, ever. I have, may Allah have mercy on all the Muslim men out here that are single. May Allah have mercy on you. It's rough. It's tough going home by yourself every night. I know, I know what that feels like, at least vaguely, because uh, Alhamdulillah, I've been married for over two decades. So th that was a long time ago. Um, but vaguely, I still remember what that feels like. And so marriage was a se seen as a, as, a, as a sign of honor and prestige. And today, many Muslims have either lost interest in marriage or have embraced a more westernized idea of relationships without any social obligation or re religious obligation, meaning boyfriend, girlfriend. In Islam, Muslims are taught to have high standards, especially in intimate spaces where two people have committed themselves to one another. When Abu Talha, who was a non-Muslim at the time, came to ask Um Sulaim for her hand in marriage, and she was a new convert to Islam. This was the mother of Anas ibn Malik, she was a convert to Islam. I wrote a whole entire book on, on her story and you know how she maintained her honor called The Paradox of Change. A new Muslim's guide to you know 
how to endure the trials at the beginning of your conversion to Islam. Um Sulaim was a convert to Islam and Anas was her son. And Anas went on to become one of the great scholars of Islam, one of the great companions of the Prophet Sallallahu But she was proposed to by a non-Muslim man. His name was Abu Talha at that, at that time. He eventually converted to Islam, but at the time that he proposed to her, he was a non-Muslim. And Um Sulaim, rather than giving in to the situation, she stood her ground. She said, a man of your caliber should never be rejected when he asks for a woman's hand in marriage. A man like you should never be rejected by a woman when he asks for a hand in marriage. She said, but there's a problem. You're a non-Muslim. I'm a Muslim. And there's no way that we could be together. She said, but I'll tell you what. She said, if you accept Islam, you convert to Islam, you take your shahada, I'll make your shahada my dowry. I'll make your shahada my dowry and I won't ask you for anything else. You see how wise the women were in that time? They didn't give in, oh, because he's handsome or because he has money or because he has a, you know, the potential to become a good Muslim. No. She said, if you take your shahada, and of course the, the hadith doesn't mention the backstory, but in the book I mentioned the backstory, she actually gave him dawah. She actually called him to Islam. So it wasn't that, oh, he just took shahada to marry her. There was a whole conversation that went on before that. And that was on a day-to-day -day basis, she was kind of giving him dawah, calling him to Islam. She said, if you take your shahada, become Muslim, I'll make your shahada my dowry. I'll accept that as my dowry. I won't ask you for anything else. And what do you think he did? He took his shahada, of course. But the preservation of the institution of marriage is a duty upon the Muslim community as a whole. It's not just my responsibility to talk about the importance of marriage. It's every imams, every student of knowledge, every person in a leadership position, every elder in our community, everyone who has been married for a substantial amount of time. It becomes collectively all of our responsibility to make sure that we continue to pass on this tradition of marriage to our children and our grandchildren. To make sure that marriage becomes the, the standard in our community, so much so that boyfriends and girlfriends, this type of relationship is something that is frowned upon within our communities. And the responsibilities that come along with the roles of husband and wife, the Prophet Wasallam, he never neglected any of these. He invested in all of his marriages what was necessary and in return he got the energy that he needed to tackle the multifaceted roles that he played in his community. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the best of you are the best of you to your wives and I am the best of you men to my wives. Pay attention to the hadith. He said, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli, wa ana khayrukum li ahli. The best of men, look at the standard that he is using. He said, the best of you men are the men that are best to their wives. That's the standard. You want to be seen as a good man? The good man is the man that is good to his family. And I'm the best of you men when it comes to my families. So this narration not only shows that the Prophet Wasallam took pride in the more intimate spaces that he shared with his wives, but it also highlights the beauty of Islam in that it has made the kindness that a man displays to his wife, his wives, and his children as one of the greatest acts of righteousness that he could perform. It also makes the man who caters to his family the best of men in contrast to the other acts of bravery wherein greatness is usually recognized. A man is usually recognized for, you know, being a businessman or being, you know, uh, courageous on the battlefield. That's usually where the greatness of men is recognized. But here the Prophet Sallallahu added to that, that list of actions by which a man is considered great if he is good to his family. Among the things by which a man is considered great in Islam is the way that he treats his wife, the way that he treats his family. This in and of itself shows the standard of virtue in the religion of Islam, that the standard of virtue in Islam is gauged by how a man treats his family and how this virtue is cultivated through the institution of marriage. So I'm going to, with that intro, I'm going to briefly go through some of the rights of the husband and the wife. So that we can be clear about this. The, I'm going to mention three hadith 
All right, and within those three hadith, we'll be able to, you know, elaborate a little bit more on the rights of the husband and wife from an Islamic standpoint. Keep in mind, Islam does not detail, define the extent of these rights, right? Because Islam just gives us the skeleton and our individual situation will clothe that skeleton based upon what is necessary for us as individuals, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say that you, when you marry this woman, you have to give her X amount of dollars or you have to provide for her a home that looks like X, Y, Z. Islam doesn't say that. Islam just says the, the general command that a man is the protector and maintainer of his family. The man is to provide the woman with a place to live. And then their own individual situation will dictate to what degree that, that living quarter, that living space should look like. You guys follow me? Does that, does that make sense? Because it would be hard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to set a standard that this is the way that every man is supposed to provide for his wife. And then what if every man cannot meet that standard? So Islam does not give the details to these, you know, these commands. So the first hadith is the hadith that is collected um, in Sahih al-Bukhari uh, on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhum. On the authority of Abu, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhum. On the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said Ja'a rajulun ila rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wa qala ya rasulullah Ya Rasulullah, ma haqqu zawja Excuse me, the hadith is on Jab On the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah Radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma Qala qala rajlun Ya Rasulullah Ma haqqu zawjati ahadina Zawjati ahadina alayhi O Messenger of Allah What is the right of one of our wives over us? Excuse me, the hadith is on the authority of Hakim ibn Muawiyah Sorry about that Hakim ibn Muawiyah On the authority of his father who said O Messenger of Allah, what is the right of one of our wives over us? Now, if you look at the question, he didn't ask, what is my right over my wife? Because the concern for the Sahaba, unlike us in today's time, the concern was, what do I have to give rather than what am I to receive? And, and that's part of where most of our dilemma comes from. Because we go into the marriage, or well, what are you bringing to the table? I.e., what are you bringing to me? How am I going to benefit from you being my spouse? Whether husband or wife, we both do it. And I wish that we would eliminate that question from the whole sit down process. This whole idea of what do you bring to the table? Because the fact of the matter is that what you think you're bringing to the table at this current moment in your life may not be the thing that stays at the table as you move on in your life married. Everybody comes into the marriage self-deluded. Especially if you've never been married before. You think you got it all figured out. Until you are paired in the relationship with this person and you're living at home with this person. And you don't have your mother, your father, you don't have the wali, you don't have anybody else. There's just you and her or her and him. And you got to figure it out. All of the things that you thought you knew about yourself are now out the window. Because you have to now relearn yourself in a different capacity. You, what you knew about yourself was when you were single. Everybody is the famous words of Mike Tyson. Everybody got it all figured out until they get punched in the face. Everybody got it all figured out until they get married and you're home and you're with this person and now you are responsible for them. You're responsible for their quirks. You're responsible for their weaknesses. You're responsible for their strengths. You're responsible for all of that. You're responsible for their emotions. You're responsible for their physical you know, uh, capabilities. You're responsible for all of that. And now you start to lose yourself because as you start to see this mountain of responsibilities in front of you, you start to focus more on that than you do yourself and you end up losing yourself in the process, relearning yourself as you are trying to cater to this person within your, you know, within the, 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 the construct of the marriage. You are relearning yourself as a married person. On a day-to-day -day basis. So this whole idea of this is what I'm bringing to the table. Yeah, that's what you're bringing to the table now. Tomorrow, it's a different story. It's a different conversation. 
Ask any man. I, one of the few, one of many, knew I thought I had it all figured out. I'm coming to the table. I'm bringing this. I'm bringing that. And then when you marry this woman and she requires this, she requires that. The situation, because of this, requires that. You start to say to yourself, I, I don't even know if I'm the man that I thought I was. And in reality, you're not. Same thing with the woman. She come in thinking, you know, I'm, I'm just Muslim. All so I got to do is make my five prayers, wear my hijab and obey my husband. And everything is supposed to come to me. And then she doesn't factor in the, that this man requires certain things from her, both emotionally, both physically. Sometimes he don't even know how to communicate it. So she got to think for him and for her. Something that you weren't even prepared for. Then you have to think about how the financial situation shifts. He may look like he has it all figured out financially. And then lo and behold, a test life throws them a curveball. And now you're in a two bedroom shack somewhere. You're living, you know, with your parents. You're living somewhere that you have absolutely no intention on living in that space. But here you are. And you got to figure it out. So eliminate this, this question <laughs> Eliminate this question, what are you bringing to the table? Because that question is more personalized. It's about what, meaning, what are you bringing to me? When we say, what are you bringing to the table? Then that should mean, what am I bringing to the marriage? How are we pouring into this marriage so that it works for both of us? Not what are you bringing to the table, meaning what are you bringing to me for me to benefit from? The conversation should be centered around what are you bringing to the marriage? What are you pouring into this cup? We have our own individual cups. You are a cup. She's a cup. And then you have the cup that is your marriage. You begin filling your own cup up so that you can pour into the cup that is your marriage. What are you bringing to the cup? What are you contributing to the cup that we call marriage? Got to re, we got to recalibrate our outlook. But he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, what is the right of one of our wives over us? What is the right of one of our wives over us? His concentration was on the, the right of the wife over him, not what is my right over my wife. So that means that when we're teaching spousal rights in Islam, when we're teaching spousal rights, I think the concentration should be on uh, the women learning the rights of the men and the men learning the rights of the women, not the opposite. What we usually do, if you got a hot spot and you want to turn it on, I think that'll work better. Okay. This, this thing goes in and out sometimes. Is, am I back on? My one. Oh, you can't see. Not yet. Okay. Someone has a hot spot. Put it on. I got mine. Okay. 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 Turn your, your volume down. Okay. So. But you, you can contribute to the marriage. Is what you want to talk. Recording in progress. Mute them. Whoever's on. Okay. So he asked, what is the right of one of our wives over us? Their concentration was more on what they had to give. Their, more, their concern was more of what they had to give rather than what they were to receive. And the Prophet Sallallahu listened to the rights. And then I want us to be something that I was doing with my students is being able to conceptualize. I think a lot of times what we're, when we miss the mark is that we look at hadith or we look at the Prophet Sallallahu statements and we look at the statements individually as just a statement. But embedded within that statement, 
There are concepts that we are sh or should be able to pull out to apply to our lives. That's how we, you know, make the text from the Quran and the Sunnah relevant. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, and tuta'imuha idha ta'amta, that you feed her when you feed yourself. You feed her when you feed yourself. وَتَكْسُوهَا إِذَا اكْتَسَيْتَ And you clothe her when you clothe yourself. Meaning, what you do for yourself, you do for her. That gives her equal status. Why? Because prior to Islam, women were not given equal status in a marriage. Islam came and elevated woman from being here, subclass, you know, individual within the marriage, to raising her to being equal partner in the marriage. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah to Anam, Surah number six, that uh, and they say the, the talking about the pagan Arabs before Islam, that if the cattle was pregnant with a calf, that if that calf was delivered alive, because that, that the meat from the calf, from the baby cow, was uh, was was sweet, it was you know lean and it was easy to eat, and that meat would only be for the men. وَقَالُوا مَا فِي بُطُونِ هَذِهِ الْأَنْعَامِ خَالِصَةٌ لِذُكُورِنَا وَمُحَرَّمٌ عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِنَا And they say that the, the, the meat of the calf, if it comes out, if the calf comes out of the belly of the animal and it is alive, when we slaughter that animal, the meat is only for the men and it is haram for the women. However, if the, calf give, the, the, the cow gives birth to a calf that is dead, and we can all eat from it. The men and the women in that case are now equal. Right? Now, now they're equal. Showing you that women did not have equal status. They didn't even eat from the same food as their husbands. But now here comes Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ says to this man when he asked, what is the right of the wife over one of us? He said that you feed her when you feed yourself. From where you feed yourself. She eats when you eat. And if your wife is a foodie, then she's eating all the time. You know, I hope you got large pockets. Because there's some women who like to eat. They enjoy eating. <laughs> that when you eat, you feed her. When you clothe yourself, you clothe her. You no longer go shopping just for you. You shop, you shop for her as well. And that's, of course, if the bare minimum of what she needs in terms of clothing is not being met. If you've already met the baseline of having, you know, what she needs in terms of clothing, then you don't necessarily have to buy her every single time you buy yourself. That's not the understanding of the hadith. But you shop, you can't be going out buying yourself Gucci, Louis Vuitton, and you buy yourself, you buy your wife's clothes from, you know, wherever you, some thrift store, right? No, you buy, you buy for her the same place where you buy from yourself, buy yourself. That when you eat, you feed her. When you clothe yourself, you clothe her. Right? Then he said, وَلَا تَضْرِبِ الْوَجْ Don't strike her in the face. وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ And don't insult her verbally. Don't insult her. Don't call her out of her name. Don't disrespect her. وَلَا تَهْجُرْهَا إِلَّا فِي الْبَيْتِ And do not boycott her except in the home. Meaning if you are going to avoid your wife, you're going to be mad at her, angry at her, then do all of that in the home. Not outside of the home. Because when you do it outside of the home, it's called abandonment. When you, leave the when you leave the home, you take your clothes, you go to your mom's house, you go to this person's house, you go stay somewhere else, that's called abandonment. I get it, provided there are some situations that are extremely toxic where two people have to separate, but you should be clear about the separation, not that I just grab my stuff, I walk out of the door in anger, and you never hear from me again for the next month or two or three or in some instances, you never hear from them again. Meanwhile, the woman is left in limbo. She don't know whether she married or divorced. I haven't heard from my husband in three months. What? What? I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I know of situations. Woman, she messages, oh, I, I haven't heard from my husband in six months. Am I still married or not? What are we doing here? What are we doing? Bring closure to the situation and just say, hey, I don't think the situation is working out. Um, the same way you pursued her by going through Hawali and you know, wanting to talk to her brother, wanting to talk to this one, then do the same thing as you exit the marriage. 
Do the same thing as you exit the marriage. But it's not just, let me just grab my things and go and that's it. It doesn't work like that. But the Prophet wasallam he highlighted. So if you look at these things, we can break them down into concepts. He said, don't strike her in the face, meaning no physical abuse. Don't insult her, no verbal abuse. And don't boycott her except in the home, no emotional abuse. If a man grabs his things and he leaves out of the home and she's texting him and calling him and he's not answering, not responding. In some instances, women will have their children calling to the, the, their father, reaching out, and he still doesn't answer the phone. How you don't answer the phone for your children? Because you're mad at your wife. I mean, like, I don't understand, like, there's some, like, men training that needs to go on. Like, adult male men training. Training for males to teach them, you know, the parameters that there's certain things that as men, we just don't do. We have to learn how to deal with whatever hurt, pain, embarrassment, emotions that we're dealing with without allowing that to trickle over into harming our children, harming other people that we are responsible for. Man, SubhanAllah. But not boycotting her except in the home. You can be mad at your wife. Go in your man cave, go in the living room. She's upstairs in her room. That's fine. But if you boycott her in the home, the reason why is number one, to keep other people out of your business. Two people, adults, are more than capable of working their problems out when they're by themselves. When you open that door and you start to let third, fourth, fifth party interferences into your marriage, it complicates it even more. Because now people are starting to, you know, Make suggestions or I would leave him or I would just divorce her or I would just marry another wife or I would just do it. and you start to entertain those things and it makes it difficult. You turn like you turn something small into something almost impossible to get beyond something very small that could have been solved in a, in a very simple way and it becomes so convoluted, so unnecessarily exacerbated. Because other people coming into your marriage to tell you and give you suggestions about how you should handle it, they're speaking from a place of privilege. Why? Because they don't know the history that is between you and that person. They don't know that you and this person that went to make Hajj before. They don't know that this person was there with you when you delivered their children. You delivered children for this person. They don't know all of the intricacies. All they know is the one problem that you bring into their attention. And they make a judgment call based upon that problem. Totally disregarding all of the experiences that transpire between you and that person, right? Subhanallah alazim, man. And people do it all the time. So, no physical abuse, no verbal abuse, no mental, emotional abuse, right? The scholars, they say that the rights of the wife are categorized into two categories. Number one is hukuk maliyah, is monetary rights. These are the rights of the wife that are related to money. Yes, you have to have money to get married. Marriage is an act of worship, just like Hajj, just like Umrah, just like Jihad, just like many other acts of worship that require money. Sadaqah, Zakat. There are many acts of worship that we have in our religion that requires a person to be financially you know, capable. And marriage is one of them. Which is why in the hadith that I mentioned before, when the Prophet ﷺ said to the young man, the young men, oh you group of young men, whoever from amongst you has the ability to get married. The scholars say that the ability here, the word that he uses, al-ba'a. Al-ba'a in the Arabic language is the ability. And the scholars say that the ability here means a number of things. Number one, the physical ability. You have the physical ability to be able to take care of a wife. Meaning satisfying her intimately. Meaning, if you are not in a position where you can satisfy a woman in, uh, uh, intimately, then either, number one, you are transparent about that and give the woman an opportunity to make an informed decision, or you just don't go into the marriage at all. Stay single. Because one of the requirements of, or one of the rights of a wife is to be satisfied intimately. And if you can't do that, then you either got to let her know ahead of time and give her the opp opportunity to say, I'm okay with your medical condition of impotence or whatever your situation is, and I have accepted that. Or to say, I don't, you know, may Allah bless you with a righteous wife, brother, but I don't think that I can handle that. Right? And there are many men that know that they are struggling, you know, with 
satisfaction, you know, intimately, and they go into the marriage and they steal the woman's ability to make an informed decision. And that's called ghish, that is deception. That is deception to know that you have a, a pre-existing medical condition and you go sit down with a sister and you marry her and you do not expose that or disclose that. That is called ghish, that is deception. Because you stole her ability to make an informed decision. Because had you told her ahead of time, she could have said, yes, I'm, I'm willing to continue into the situation with you given your circumstance. Or she could say, no, brother, I appreciate you mentioning that to me, but I don't think that I could be a wife to you under those particular circumstances. That's what's called an informed decision. And when you are not transparent about things that are going to affect the intimacy of the relationship, you are stealing that person's ability to make an informed decision. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man ghashana, falaysa minna. He who deceives us is not a part of us. I mean, it is not the behavior of a Muslim to deceive someone, to take advantage of someone in that fact, in, in, that, in that regard. So the woman has what's called hukuk and maliya, monetary rights, rights that are connected to money. So let's go through those first. Shall we? You guys follow me? Am I putting anybody to sleep? So the monetary rights of the wife are number one, she has a right to a dowry. Al-mahar. And the mahar doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, money per se. Woman doesn't necessarily have to choose something that is money, it's uh, per se, but she has something, she chooses something that is of value, that has some type of monetary value, right? During the time of the Prophet wasallam, a woman, she came to ask the Prophet wasallam to release her from the marriage with this particular companion because she didn't want to be married to him anymore. And the Prophet asked her, can you give him back what he gave you as a dowry? And what he gave her as a dowry was a piece of land. He gave her a piece of land and she turned that land into a garden where she began to produce fruits and vegetables and make money from it. Here again, I'm trying to give women a hint. If you're asking for a dowry, then ask for something that is of value. You ask for money and you spend it, then your dowry is gone. Or if you ask for money, then take that money and invest it in something that will continue to produce more money. Money, let money make money. Don't ask for $5,000 as a dowry, right? And then go spend it all on, you know, shoes and, and bags. And your husband's going to buy that for you anyway. Marriage hack. Your husband's going to buy that for you anyway. Why ask for $5,000 as a dowry and then take that $5,000 and go buy a pocketbook, go buy some shoes, go buy some other jewelry when you could have just pocketed that $5,000 and asked your husband to buy you a pocketbook, buy you some shoes, and buy you some jewelry. He's going to buy that for you anyway. You know, just be smart. Be smart with, you know, with your dowry. But the dowry is mandatory. A man has to have to give their wives their dowry. Allah mentions in Surah number four, ayah four, wa atu nisa nihla, and give the women their dowries as an obligation. And there's no cap on or no ceiling on how much a woman can ask for a dowry. Here's another issue that we shamed as Muslim men. We've kind of shamed Muslim women into asking for lower dowries to satisfy our inadequacy to be able to fulfill that right. So a woman asks for $2,000 for a dowry and we say, oh, that's too much. I can't afford that. And then we go on this long tangent about women and high dowries and how the Prophet ﷺ said the woman who chooses a, a dowry of me meager means then uh, it is the dowry that is blessed or their marriage will be blessed. And we use these type of narrations to manipulate women to ask for less than what they believe they deserve. And that's not fair to use the religion in that fashion. If a woman asks for a dowry that is beyond your means, then just say it like it is. Baby, I would give you the world if I could, but I cannot give you that. And we just simply can't say that. Woman asks for a dowry that's pretty, pretty seem, seemingly high. And what we say is, well, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said the woman who asked for, you know, a dowry that is, you know, that is simple, you know, the marriage is blessed. So now she's forced to believe, OK, well, maybe what I'm asking for is not simple. And let me lower my standards and ask for something that is a little bit more simple so my marriage can be blessed. That's what she's left to believe. It's manipulation. Rather than saying, 
I respect the fact that that's what you want as a dowry. I, at this particular point in my life, cannot afford to give you that. Is there some way that we can negotiate with that? Can I give you half of that now or a portion of that now? And then, you know, we can make some payments. Uh, you can put me on a payment plan, a payment schedule, right? And for women who are making payment arrangements with their, you know, husbands, then make the payment arrangement with your father. Include your father in that. Because as a man begins to marry you and get deeply into the marriage, he believes that once you fall in love with him, you'll totally forget about what is left that he owes you. Or they can use their charm to, you know, kind of make you smooth that over. Yeah, I know I owe you, you know, $7,000 more to your dowry, but we're in love and, you know, we have children and a family. And, you know, I just think that, you know, you should just kind of let that go. No. No. That is her haq. That is her right. And you'll be asked about that. Yomokiyama. You'll be asked about that. Number two, from the monetary rights of the wife is a nafaka, is financial provision. And that includes a ta'am wa kiswa, what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith, and that is food and clothing. Food and clothing. A man is responsible, and whatever that entails. Here again, Islam just gives us the broad rules. No specifics, because everybody's situation is different. What one woman, what, what one woman may need or require in terms of food and clothing may be different than what another woman needs in terms of food and clothing. So Islam does not specify the details. The details are explained based upon your individual situation. But that is her haq. That is her right. She is entitled to food, to be fed, and to be clothed. That is her haq. And you guys can negotiate, you know, how much food and how much clothing and how often, how frequent. Right? Number three, from the monetary rights of the wife, as a sukna, is housing. And this is a this is a big one. This is a big one. And hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, I put a clip out the other day. I'll reiterate what I put out here so that we can simplify this matter a little bit more. We've overcomplicated this unnecessarily. A man is responsible for providing housing for his wife. Source, source number 65, I 6, Surah Al-Talaq. The irony that Allah mentions providing housing for a woman who's divorced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَسْكِنُوهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ سَكَنْتُمْ مِنْ وُجْدِكُمْ وَلَا تُضَرُّوهُنَّ لِتُضَيِّقُوا عَلِيهِنَّ And house the divorced women where you house yourself. Meaning wherever you put a roof over your head, the woman that you divorced... You put a roof over her head in the same place until her idda period is done. Now, if a man has to provide for a woman who is on her way out of the marriage, then how much more would that be an obligation on him to a man who is happily married to his wife? If you still have to provide for a woman that is being divorced, terminating the marriage, and you still have to provide for her until her idda period is finished, then how much more would a woman who is not divorced? You are responsible for providing housing for her. Here again, Islam doesn't stipulate or detail what type of housing. Should it be an apartment? Should it be a house? Just housing. House the divorced women in the same place where you house yourself. Now, the dilemma that we have in today's time is that a lot of uh, brothers and sisters, they have their own places prior to you know coming to the table to discuss marriage. All right? The guy, he has his own apartment, has his own home that he's been living in for however long he's been living. The woman, she has her own home, her own apartment that she's been living in however long she's been living in. Now, they come to the table to discuss marriage and the future together. The question always arises, well, who has to give up whose place? The woman, usually, I'm not giving up my place. I've been living here for, you know, five years, ten years since I graduated from college. I'm not giving up my place. So then that forces the man to now make a sacrifice, give up his place, and then move in with her. The danger with moving in with her is that he has no security because everything is in her name. Everything is in her name. So he has no security. At any point, she could say, get out. At any point, she could say, you know, I'm, I don't feel comfortable with you here anymore. Can you please grab your things and go? There's no security. Not to mention 
the marriage that didn't last, now where's he supposed to go? He grabs his things and now I got to go, you know, back out on a hunt for an apartment. Where am I supposed to put my things in storage, you know, and then move in with you? And the danger with moving in so quickly, and I don't understand why we do that. There is nothing, let me say this in the clearest language that I can say, and I can say it. There are no Islamic law legislation that is mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah that mandates that husband and wife move in with each other soon as they get married. There's nothing that stipulates that. Shh. There is nothing that stipulates that. Husband and wife can figure out that situation, you know, and I think what happens is we move in with each other way too quickly. We have two, three sit downs, four sit downs with the person. We don't really know the person. And then we move in with this person, not fully understanding the scope of what we are getting ourselves into. Because during the sit down process, the, nobody exposes to you the full scope of their personality. Everybody exposes to you what they think they need to expose to you to paint a picture to help you influence your decision. Right or wrong? Most people, most people are coming to the sit down with this image of themselves that they believe is the image that they need to portray to help influence your decision. Rather than coming to the sit down as I am, take me as I am, leave me as I am, because in many instances, we can't handle rejection. Especially men, we can't handle rejection. We can't handle a woman saying, nah, I'm good, brother. That's what turned many, many men into players. Behind every man who believes he's a pimp, or he's a player, or he has multiple women always you know, on his side, Behind that man is a, is a young boy who was hurt by a woman at some point in his life. Whether that was his mother, that was his female caretaker, or that was some girl in his life that he thought he was in love with. That's a fact. We, we take it very hard. Those injuries to our ego, we sometimes, we just never recover from them. We never recover from them. But you are responsible for providing housing for your wife. What I would suggest is that two people just kind of, he doesn't have to give up his place. She doesn't have to give up her place until you're ready. Once you're married, you're married. She can come stay with you for a few days out of the week. You can stay with her for a few days out of the week. And you guys can work that out until you're tired of doing that. And then sit down and put your heads together and decide on what you're going to do. But at that point, when you just sit down to decide whether you're going to give her your place up or she's going to give her place up, by that time, you already know each other. And you can make it a more informed decision. But having three or four sit downs with someone, signing the marriage contract, giving up all of the things in your apartment and then moving in with somebody else. I think that's a snap decision that we have seen that that decision does not usually work. That's a roll of the dice. And the older you are, the more secure you are, the more you do not like rolling dice. Not to mention gambling is haram in Islam. I'm not rolling dice. I need surety. You understand? I need surety. So you staying sometimes at my house, me staying sometimes at your house, at your apartment, you know, until we are ready to decide to stop living like that and then put our heads together and say, OK, well, what's the best way forward? The Prophet uh, Umar radiallahu he said that you don't know a person until you live with them, travel with them, or done business with them. You don't know the person until you've lived with them. And having three or four sit downs with someone and then moving in with them, you still don't know them because you haven't lived with them. And then sometimes we move in prematurely with people and I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, stop doing that. There is nothing Islamically that says that you have to move in right away with the person. You guys have your whole entire lives to figure that out until you're tired of, you know, running back and forth and staying between each other's homes or apartments. You, you can figure it out. But it's this idea that we have, you know, inserted into the way that we conduct our marriages. OK, so who's going to move in with who? I recall my even myself and my own ignorance, you know, years ago, 
Me conducting a sit down with two people and saying, all right, well, who's going to give up whose apartment? And usually the man is more forthcoming with that. He's like, you know, well, I'll make the sacrifice. Right? Because we're, as men, we'll, we'll be willing to do whatever it takes to get what we want. And then when we, when we get it, then we kind of realize we kind of made a mistake. And I'm saying that we don't have to, you don't have to make that choice right then and there in that moment. Or here's the other option. She has her place. She doesn't want to give it up. He has his place. He doesn't want to give it up. Then we equally find a new place that we move into. I'm not moving into your place. Me personally, I'm not moving in with a woman. I'm sorry. I'm not moving into a woman's house. I think that goes against all rules for a man. And I think that's what the Prophet Wasallam was trying to protect Muawiyah from. When Fatima bin Tuqais came and said that Muawiyah proposed to me, he said, Muawiyah is poor, don't marry him. He was trying to save Muawiyah. He was going into a marriage with a woman and you're lacking financially. You are going to be reliant on this woman for everything financially. And she's the more reliant you are on her as a financial supporter, the less and less she starts to see you as a man. The less and less respect she has for you as a man. And the fourth monetary right that the woman has over her husband is al miraf, is inheritance. That immediately when people, not immediately, but at some, some point during the course of the marriage, uh, an account needs to be set up where the man is taking you know, a portion or share of his paycheck, you know, maybe $70, $100, $50, uh, every paycheck, and put it into an account as a savings account or checking account, savings account that is for his wife, for his children in the event of his demise. That needs to happen. At least within the first year or two of the marriage, that is a part of the conversation. The woman is entitled to inheritance. We've seen way too many situations in our communities where when brothers die, the wife, all of the financial burden falls on the shoulders of the wife. I mean, all the way down to the burial and the janaza. The woman is calling the masjid asking for financial support, which is roughly $2,500 to, for janaza, for a plot of land to be buried. And a man dies and he doesn't even have $2,500. I mean, think about that. So the woman, if the woman cannot pay for her own husband's funeral, what does that say about her and the children that she's responsible for now after his demise? And this is something that women need to be cognizant of. Women need to be cognizant of this. This should be part of the conversation during the sit down. Hey, I'm entitled to inheritance from you. So what are we going to do? How long do we wait before we set up an account so we can, you, you, you can start putting money little bit by little bit into that account? You know, or life insurance policy to, to the end of it. Something has to be done so that the woman is not left, as the Prophet Wasallam said, begging the people for their money. We have seen these situations way too often in our communities where women are just kind of left with all of the financial burden uh, simply because provisions were not put in place. Preparations were not made ahead of time to ensure that at least she can pay the janaza. She doesn't have to beg the Muslim community for money. Alhamdulillah, the Muslim community is very generous. Uh, no one has ever been denied anything. Um, Alhamdulillah, I know a brother who does the funeral services and there's many charitable situations that he has, you know, has given his time and energy to. I mean, we're talking about people who didn't have money to get buried. And the brother says, you know what? I'll just do it for free. Bismillah. We'll wrap the body, shroud the body. We have, you know, donations, whatever that was given. And we'll pay for a plot and we'll bury him. But it shouldn't have to be like that. It shouldn't have to be like that. Second category, really quickly is the rights, the non-monetary rights. <laughs> These are the non-monetary rights that the woman has over her husband. And the first of those rights is fairness. Al-adl. Fairness. It's fairness. Uh, and this is obviously when a man has multiple wives, he has to exercise fairness between his wives. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, you know, marry the women of your, your preference, two, three, four. And if you cannot afford those four or multiples, then stick to one. Or if you feel like you cannot be fair, then stick to one. Fairness. And this even um, re is required even when a man is in monogamy himself. Fairness. All right. Number two, husnul ishra. 
is to live with the woman in kindness. And this means that a man is supposed to position himself to be more agreeable. To have a negotiating nature. And not to be black and white. This is the way it is. Quran and Sunnah and I'm not budging on anything. Right? That's, that's the way that I came into my marriage. Thinking here again. Thinking I had it all figured out. Black and everything black and white. Well, where's the ayah for that? Where's the hadith for that? And you just make everybody's life around you miserable. Because by sticking to the Quran and the Sunnah like in a black and white fashion, it gives you the privilege to not be agreeable. And then you can use sticking to the Quran and the Sunnah as the justification for not having a negotiating spirit. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, let me ask you, was the Prophet sallallahu was he agreeable? Absolutely. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, مَا خُيِّرَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بَيْنَ أَمْرَيْنِ إِلَّا اخْتَارْ أَيْسَرَهُمَا مَا لَمْ يُكُنْ فِيهِ إِثَمْ That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was never confronted with two situations except that he opted for the easiest of the two. That means that he had a negotiating spirit. He had an agreeable temperament. Agreeable. He's never confronted with two situations except that he chose the easiest of the two so as long as there was no sin involved. Obviously, if there's, in, you know, involves disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the furthest thing from it. As we should be. This is the warning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives men in the Qur'an, right? Indeed from amongst your, oh you, oh you who believe indeed from amongst your wives and your children are enemies to you. Be aware of them. Meaning, they cause you to compromise your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone or anything that causes you to compromise your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in essence an enemy to you. Not an enemy in terms of your husband, uh, in terms of your spouse and your children. Not an enemy to the point where you have to treat the person like an enemy. But to be aware, as Allah mentions the, in, the, in the latter part of the ayah, فَحْذَرُوهُمْ Be aware of them. Be aware of them. Sometimes women as well as children in their nature, in their needy nature, sometimes they you know, want things and then here again, not thinking about the end at the beginning. And so they want you to make certain compromises that affect your religion. And the man is supposed to be wise enough to see the end at the beginning. And so therefore we lead with a no. And the no is, you know, for, for, for us, not just for you. And sometimes the women take no as an injury. It's not that he's trying to injure you or break your spirit. He's trying to protect you. Your husband is wise. Your husband is intelligent enough to see the end at the beginning. And so when he gives you the no, you want to acquiesce. You want to say, okay, all right, cool. You have your reasons. You don't necessarily have to agree with it. You can go somewhere and be mad for five, ten minutes, that's fine. But that doesn't change the no. The no is still no. But having an agreeable spirit, having an agreeable temperament. Aisha said the Prophet ﷺ was never confronted with two situations except he chose the easiest of the two. So as long as there was no sin involved. Husnu Ishra, living with one another in kindness, living with the woman in kindness. Number three is uh, the woman has a right to be educated Islamically. The woman has a right to be educated Islamically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, save yourselves, talking to the Muslim men. O you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and idols. The woman has a right. Non-monetary right number four, Adam al-Darr alayha, is that she does not be, she should not be harmed or injured, you know, whether verbally, physically. We talked about that at the beginning of the hadith. Verbally or physically injured. She has a right that you do not physically abuse her, verbally abuse her, mentally abuse her. Right? You know what mental abuse is? Give me some examples of mental abuse. Where men emotionally, mentally start to abuse their wives. What are some examples of those? Because I, I don't want to just throw terms out there without attaching, you know, an image to it so that we have a, a better understanding. What does that look like? Calling names. Huh? Calling names. That, that's verbal abuse, but it can also be emotional and mental abuse as well. They're, they they overlap, but also manipulating. Reverse psychology, manipulating, passive aggressive behavior, gaslighting, devaluing to the end. These are all examples of emotional abuse 
mental abuse, gaslighting. The woman is trying to explain to you this is the experience you're giving her and you're telling her, well, I'm only doing that because of this. You're making her believe that her experience is justified. The horrible experience you're giving her is justified because of something that she's doing rather than taking a look at something that you are doing. That's gaslighting. That's emotional manipulation. And number five, from the rights that the woman has over the husband is al is uh, sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy. Just as much as a man wants to be sexually intimate, so does his wife. And then he does not have a right to neglect her or to deny her that right. Now let's move on to the rights of the husband. Sisters, you ready for this? You might need to flip to a new page if you're writing notes in a notebook. This hadith is on the authority of Ibn Umar. أتت امرأة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت يا نبي الله ما حق الزوج أحد على زوجته. A woman on the authority of Abdullah bin Umar رضي الله تعالى عنهما, a woman came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and she said, O oh Messenger of Allah, what is the right of a husband over his wife? Look at the question. Similar to the question that the Sahabi asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Here again, the woman concerned with the rights that she has to give rather than the rights that she is to receive. What is the right? <laughs> what is the right of a wife, a, a husband over his wife? Listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said. La tamna'uhu nafsuha. That she does not deny him access to herself intimately. That's the first one. First thing he mentioned. A man should never leave out of his home sexually dissatisfied. Even when, let's, let's go a step further, even when a woman is experiencing her menstrual cycle, some women take this as a, a sabbatical, a time where they can just relax, where they don't have to please their husband sexually. Men don't get a menstrual cycle, at least not, not literally anyway. Some men, because they act like women, you, you might think that they do have a menstrual cycle. No pun intended. But, you know, so, I mean, sometimes you wonder, like, you know, what's going on with you, man? You know, you, you start to have some semblance of a woman that's on her menstrual cycle. Nonetheless, just because a woman is experiencing her menstrual cycle doesn't mean that the man is on sabbatical, too. And it's not fair that a man has to, you know, just kind of chalk it up because she's on her menstrual cycle and just leave it at that. Even though uh, the first couple of days that the woman is on her menstrual cycle, she may not feel up to it. But at the same token, that does not give her the right to deny her husband. Because denying him leads, leads to other things. You know what it's like walking around carrying all of this testosterone in our bodies on a day-to-day -day basis? And then with one click of a button on social media, we can have access to any woman in the world, but we choose you? Yeah, that's a fact. With one click of a button, a man can go and see any woman he wants on the internet completely unclothed. Albeit it's haram, I'm not justifying it, but what I'm saying is that the access is there. But a man who intentionally chooses not to look at that and wants to be intimate with his wife means that he chose you over all of the other women on the internet that he had access to. And... In addition to all of that, I deny, you deny him because you don't feel well. You're on your menstrual cycle. And it's like, okay, you're on your menstrual cycle, but I'm not. I don't have a menstrual cycle. What am I supposed to do with, with all of this? Fast. Okay, fasting, the only thing that we can do is fast every other day. So if I fast today, what about tomorrow? I can fast today, but what about tomorrow? And just because you fast, it doesn't mean that the desire goes anywhere. Then we go to work and we're surrounded by women at our workplace. Especially if you work in a predominantly female dominated environment. Like being a teacher or being a counselor or being anything dealing with social services. You're surrounded by women on a day to day basis and you go home to your wife and she has absolutely no desire to please you sexually. No man should be able to leave out of his home. Right. Sexually unfulfilled. 
The Prophet ﷺ was asked, O Messenger of Allah, what can I enjoy of my wife while she's on her menstrual cycle? The Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ this very question. What can I enjoy of my wife while she's on her menstrual cycle? The Prophet ﷺ said, everything above the waist. Everything above the waist. Meaning everything above, everything other than the actual act of penetration is fair game. So if your husband is showing that, you know, he has this desire, then, you know, you have to make a sacrifice to help fulfill that and satisfy that so that you don't leave your husband to go satisfy that desire in a manner that is haram and earn sin. You know how many men go and satisfy their desire in a manner that is haram simply because they cannot get it from their own wives? And then you know those women who deny their husbands that because you just don't feel like it or you're mad at him or you whatever the case may be that you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing the Prophet sallallahu mentioned was that she does not deny him access to herself. Obviously, there are times when a woman can deny a man access to herself. And that is if he wants to penetrate her while she's on her menstrual cycle. He wants to penetrate her in a fashion that is haram. Um, those are times, obviously, if the woman is sick, right? Obviously, if she, you know, can allowances are made for a person that's sick, like combining their prayers or not having to fast, then obviously sexual intimacy is the least of the person's worries if they're sick. All right. So there are times and instances where a woman can deny, but she should not do that. Uh, and there's no Islamic justification for that. Then the Prophet Sallallahu the woman asked, وَمَا يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مَا حَقَّ الزَّوْجِ عَلَى زَوْجَتِهِ So, okay, well, what is another right of the wife, of the husband over the wife? And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, لَا تَسُومُوا إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ إِلَّا الْفَرِيضَ That the woman does not fast except with her husband's permission unless it is an obligatory fast. Meaning fasting the month of Ramadan or making up one of the days that she has to make up after Ramadan is over. Those fasts are mandatory. She does not need her husband's permission to do that. But if she's fasting, for example, Mondays and Thursdays or fasting three days out of the month or fasting because she just, you know, she wants to fast and get her reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she should consult with her husband before she does so. Why? Why consult with the husband? What does the husband have to do with her ibadah, her worship to Allah? Intimacy, once again. Intimacy, once again. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not a coincidence that he's honing in on this. He's honing in on this for the man's benefit. We live in a society now that is hypersexualized. Everything in our society is revolves around sex. Music, you know, TV, TV shows, every movie, even movies that don't necessarily even require a sex scene has a sex scene. Just like Hollywood says, this is our tradition, just throw it in there. Even though the movie doesn't even call for it. It just has to happen. But this is what we are exposed to on a day to day basis. And I don't think that, you know, women really see it like that. Then you have, you know, the LGBT and this is their month and all of this stuff is plastered all over the TV, all over the radio, all over the stores, everywhere you go. Hypersexualized society. And living in these type of environments, a woman would do good to make sure that her husband, you know, for the most part, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, sexually satisfied. Or at least he knows where he can come to get sexually satisfied. The Prophet Sallallahu said that if one of you men walk out of your home and you see something that ignites your desire, then go home to your wife for in the ma'aha ma ma'aha, because your wife has what she has. Go home and satisfy your desire. But what happens when a man goes home to a wife that has no desire to be intimate? So she should not fast except with his permission unless it is an obligatory fast. Then the woman said, oh, Messenger of Allah, okay, well, what is the further right of the husband over the wife? And the Prophet Wasallam said, La tasaddaq, la tasaddaq bi shay'in min baytihi illa bi idnihi, that she should not spend anything in charity from his home except with his permission. She does not take anything from his wealth and spend it without his permission. She said, what else is the right of the husband over the wife? And the Prophet said, لَا تَخْرُجُوا مِنْ بَيْتِهَا مِنْ بَيْتِهِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِي That she does not leave out of his home except with his permission. I'll say that again. She should not leave out of his home except 
with his permission. And at the end of the hadith, the woman says, She said, Wallahi, if these are the rights of the husband over the wife, I will never give a man authority over me. Meaning, I'm not in a position right now in my life to give a man that level of authority over me. Pay attention to that portion of the hadith. Why? Because the story behind this hadith is that the father of the woman was trying to force his daughter to get married. And he brought her to the Prophet ﷺ and said, my daughter does not want to obey me and me commanding her to get married. And then she asked the Prophet ﷺ, well, what are the rights of the husband over his wife? The Prophet begins to explain these things. And at the end, she says, well, if those are the rights of the husband over his wife, I will never give a man authority over me. I'm not ready for that. She's being honest with her father. You're trying to force me into marriage. I'm not a, a, in a place in my life where I'm ready for a man to have that level of authority over me. The point that I'm making here, sisters, is that you have two options. Either you can go into a marriage fully accepting the role that is being handed to you when you go into it, or you realizing that I ain't cut out for this and stay the heck out of marriage altogether. But you cannot go into a marriage and manipulate the marriage to work for you the way that you want it to work. It does not work like that. That's not the way that it works. There are roles, there are responsibilities, there are guidelines. You cannot come into a marriage and manipulate it to get it to work the way that you want it to work. And so here again, let's conceptualize. We had to break all of these rights down, right? Number one, the, the, the right to uh, sexual intimacy. Number two, not, a, uh, not leaving out of his home without his uh, permission. Number three, not fasting in his presence without his permission. Uh, number four, which we didn't mention in this hadith, but mentioned in another hadith, and that is that she does not allow anybody into his home without his permission. Be that your mother, be that your sisters, be that whoever. You don't allow anybody into the home of your husband. And this, of course, is especially if it's, a, if it's the husband's home. See, what complicates things is if it's her house and he's still demanding that he has those rights. So if it's a woman's home, the deed is in her name, the house is in her name, the apartment is in her name. And then a man is trying to impose on her his rights that you don't allow anybody into my home without, without my permission. But it's her home. So how does that now work? This is where it becomes complicated for us. Because as a man, you, it's, it's hard for you to request your rights from someone when you are not the foundation of those rights. You are not fulfilling your part in, the, in those rights. So how, how does a woman tell, how does a woman whose home is in her name, you don't pay any bills in the house, right? And then you're asking her to ask you permission before she leaves out of her home, not your home. Or you're asking her to ask you permission before she lets somebody into her home, not your home. You, you see how that works? It's kind of like, it's really hard for her to obey you in that. Because it's like, how do I ask you permission to let somebody into my house? The hadith says his house, except with his permission. <laughs> so that's when it becomes complicated. When men demand their rights from a woman when they don't actually deserve those. If the man is not paying anything, you're, you're getting a basically a free ride. She gets up, go to work every day, pays all of the bills in the house and you're just there. And even though she's accepted that position, how is she now supposed to give you that right of not leaving out of the home or not allowing anybody into the home when it's actually her home? You know, I personally will feel a little uncomfortable trying to impose on her to give me that right. That particular hawk, we can forego that. We can we can overlook that. Don't worry about that one. The other ones, yes, but that one, you, you can't really impose that and there's another right that the uh, Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, and that is, of course, wujub uh, al It is that to obey the husband. Now, I have a different take on obeying the husband. I believe that the woman is tasked with obeying Allah, and the husband just reaps the benefit. If a woman obeys Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then the husband reaps the benefit of her obedience to Allah by automatically being obedient to her husband. Not necessarily obedient, but I like to use the word willfully compliant. Because the woman still has a choice. And if she consciously choose to comply 
with your requests or your demands, that's called willful compliance. But when we throw around this phrase or this term, obey your husband, as if she doesn't have an option to obey you, she has an option. She has an option to obey God. How much more with her husband? It's, it's a choice that she makes. Right? And the last right, number five. So number one was uh, obedience or willful compliance. Number two, sexual intimacy. Number three, not to let somebody into his home except with his permission. Number four, not to leave out of his home except with his permission. Number five, not to fast uh, an, uh, a non-obligatory fast except with his permission. And number six, and here's the kicker, and that is khidmat to zawj, and that is servicing your husband. So let me break this down. Let me, die, let me, let me rip, the, rip apart this or dissect this myth that some women come up with. I don't know where they come up with it. Oh, doing laundry and cleaning the house is not an obligation on her. All right, how many women, by a show of hands, are of that opinion? Because we want to have an honest conversation here. You believe that doing dishes, doing the laundry, cleaning the home, that all of that is, you know, just out of your, you know, out of your goodwill, so to say. Not necessarily an obligation on you. You don't have to do those things. But if you choose to do them, then you, you know, you're going to get rewarded for it. Any women here under that belief? Any men ever heard a woman say something remotely close to that? Have you ever? Uh, yeah, we've heard that. So, a sister said, oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, you might want to say maybe until I'm finished. <laughs> you can straddle the fence until I finish saying what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay, so we got to we gotta, uh, add it. No, it's not an obligation. Masha Allah, to Allah, Allah. It's a woman's jihad. Got you. Keep going. I want to pull it all out. Pull it all out. So we can clarify this in one, one shot. Be done with it. Woman does not have to clean the home. First of all, I don't know what woman would say, I don't have to clean my home. Like, well, I mean, who raised you? I don't blame you. I blame your mom. I, I want to have a conversation with your mom to figure out whether or not, because I know your mother, especially if you were raised, you were born in the 70s or mid to late 80s. I'm almost positive your mother did not raise you like that. Now, you 90s babies and you millennials and you Generation X, uh, Gen Zs, um, different, you know, whole different orientation. If you were born and raised in the 70s, I'm almost positive your mom did not teach you that. You don't, you don't have to clean your house. <laughs> Like, first of all, who says that? I don't, technically, I don't have to clean my house. I don't have to do dishes. I do that because out of the kindness of my heart. No, you should do that because cleanliness is next to godliness. I'm sure every Christian parent, every one of us who converted to Islam and your parents were Christian and you were raised in Christ Christianity, that that was part of the philosophy of your family. Cleanliness is next to godliness, right? Anybody in here convert to Islam from Christianity? And yep, absolutely. That's number one. <laughs> so to say, you know, I don't have to clean, I don't have to do that. You know, it's, it's really embarrassing for somebody to even uh, must up the courage to utter those words in public. If you were born in the 70s, you got up Saturday morning, your mom was playing Al Green, your mom was playing, you know, whatever she was playing, cool in the gang, whatever she was playing in the kitchen, and the whole house was cleaning. I would say even all the way up to those who were born up, in, up until about 85. Yeah, anytime after 85, I, I don't know. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. Couldn't find a better person to quote this from. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, وَالتَّجِبْ خِدْمَةَ زَوْجِهَا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَتَنَوَّعْ ذَلِكَ بِالْتَنَوَّعِ أَحْوَالِ وخدمة القوية ليست كالخدمة الضعيفة. Imam Ahmed, رحمه الله تعالى, he said that servicing a woman servicing her husband, خدمة الزوج واجب. 
A woman servicing her husband in the home is wajib, is mandatory. This is Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, came many generations later. I'm going to go back. Imam al-Shafi'i, as well as Imam Ahmed, they were all under the opinion that the woman's role, part of the husband's right over the wife is for her to service her husband. And whatever capacity the husband requests, of course, within reason, right? He's not going to ask her to get on the roof and clean the chimney, right? But cleaning the home, uh, ironing the clothes, or doing laundry, cleaning the dishes, or cooking. These are all part of khidmat to zoj, all a part of servicing the husband, providing an atmosphere, an environment in the home that makes the husband feel comfortable. Wajib. Wajib. There was no argument in that. The Shafi'iya wal Hanabila. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, and the woman servicing her husband in the home depends on what the service, the service that's necessary and based upon the woman's ability. He said the strong woman is different than the weak woman. Meaning a woman who's sick, a woman who has multiple children, obviously burdened by other circumstances and situations, is not going to be on the same level of a, of a woman who is fully capable, healthy, has no medical situations, and do not have you know, other extenuating circumstances that will prevent her from doing that. Just completely lazy. You don't feel like doing anything. So it differs based upon circumstance and situation, but no woman has the right to say, oh, this is just my jihad, or I don't necessarily have to do it. It's not an obligation on me. No, it is an obligation on you. Whatever the husband asks you to do in the home becomes an obligation upon you. So as long as that task that he's asking or requesting of you is not beyond your physical or mental capability. Now, should a man help? Should the man just sit back and kick his legs up and let her vacuum underneath his feet and, you know, go get me, you know, my food and, you know, bring it to me here. And I spill all types of stuff on the floor and don't clean up after myself. I come in the house and I take off my shirt and I leave my sweaty shirt on the dining room floor. Or I take off my shoes and I leave them over here. Or I take off my socks and leave them over there. And the woman's just here, you know, as your servant to pick up after you and clean up behind you. No. Let's look back at our example. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'll end with this. Aisha was asked, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do in the home? He's the best of men. He's our example. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do in the home? Aisha said, kana fi khidmati ahlihi. Use the same word, khidma. He was in the service of his family. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do at, 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 at home? She said he was in the service of his family. He used to sew his own clothes. He used to fix the sandals on his strap or, or, or fix the straps on his sandals. And he would go out to the well and go get his own water from the well. He was in the service of his family. Here again, the hadith that I mentioned, you know, before where he said the best of you are those who are best to their wives. And I'm the best of you to my wives. So this puts the onus or the responsibility on the husband as well to help out in the home. And so while we are tasking our wives with doing this and doing that, and we come home from work and we see that the task is not done, rather than complaining about it, just realize that sometimes your wife might be overwhelmed by other things and just jump in and help. For you, it's a sadaqah. For her, it's an obligation because you tasked her with it. But as the Prophet ﷺ did with his companions, he never tasked them with something that was beyond their capability. And if he saw that it was, he would help them out. Right When they were building his masjid, he was carrying some of the bricks on his shoulders as well. When he went out to fight jihad, he didn't send the sahaba out. He was at the forefront of the line. He was in the front of the line. Many of the sahaba said we were hiding behind the Prophet ﷺ while we were fighting battle. So he never tasked his companions with doing something except that he was on the front line with them to do it. And we should be the same way in our homes with our wives that when we task our families with something, then we should be willing to jump in and help. Don't look at it as, okay, well, I asked you to do the laundry. I came home and the laundry wasn't done. All right, I get it. I'll just do it. 
rather than complain, rather than saying anything about it, let me just jump in and help. Because for you, it's a sadaqah, it's a charity. When you complain and you say, well, you, you've been home all day long, like, what, what were you doing all day long? Your wife is looking at you like, I was doing nothing but taking care of your kids all day long, you know. Juggling this one, breastfeeding this one, and doing this with this one. I'm sorry I didn't get around to the laundry. Can you jump in and help me out? So, you know, these are just some of the guidelines, the rules, regulations. Marriage is not that complicated. Wallahi, it's not. We are complicated. Marriage within itself is not complicated. We as human beings are complicated, but the more we learn ourselves, the more we are able to navigate our way through the marriage. But the more we neglect ourselves and leave the other person to figure us out, then it complicates the marriage. The more you learn who you are and what your quirks are and what you need and what you require, the better you are able to articulate to your spouse what you need to you know, give you a happy experience. But if you just neglect yourself and leave your spouse to kind of figure you out like some type of Rubik's Cube, then of course the, the marriage is going to be complicated unnecessarily. One of the things that will help us out moving forward is to learn your love language. Learn how you want to be loved and how you communicate love. If you can do that and then articulate to, to that to your spouse in hopes that your spouse would be able to, you know, satisfy that. You're good to go. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, uh, uh, I'll stop here. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and taslimin kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil la izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. I'd like to thank Imam Shadi for his uh, very informative information. I, I pray that everybody took notes. I got two and a half pages myself, and I know I missed a lot. So, because he gave up so much. So, we ask a lot of reward him. And we ask a lot of reward all of you for um, listening and, and coming out and sacrificing your time for this worship. Uh, this is definitely a topic that we see is very important for our community uh, and that's why we wanted to present it to our community so that we can inshallah we ask Allah that he can increase our uh, levels or our, our amounts of people getting married brothers and sisters we also ask Allah that he can give us a more solid foundation in our marriage in our marriages and that this information is beneficial and useful for us uh, if you wish to get more information on these it's in the path of islam lecture series with the free library of philadelphia you can go on the website online the uh, free library of philadelphia forward slash in the path of islam and you can see the future upcoming lectures that are coming you can also maybe in a couple of days or an hour a couple hours or so review the imam shadid lecture that we just experienced uh, so that you can get the points that you may have missed um, I think that's about it. May Allah reward us. Barakallahu alaykum, jamian, for everybody. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Questions and answers, right? Okay, so we, we have we have a little bit of time for some questions and answers, inshallah. So what we'll do is um, is there is there um people on the Zoom? Yeah, he's gonna let me. Know. Okay, so if there are any the those that are on the Zoom, if you have a question, you can go, kind of send it. And uh, he he'll ask the he'll answer the question or he'll ask the question to me and I'll answer it. And for those of you on who are online, if you have a question, you can just type your question in, inshallah, and I'll do my best to answer the question. So if they type it in, you can just read the question out. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you have mentioned about um, uh, um, the right of um, being able to recording in progress. Food, um, in, in that light, in that regard, is the husband, um, is he within his re right to uh, restrict food if his wife is a diabetic? Or would you say that that's like uh, beyond her capacity or overbearing if she doesn't uh, want like non-diabetic food type of thing? 
Well, there's no such thing as non diabetic <laughs> food. <laughs> I get your point, though. <laughs> I get your point. All right, so you're, he's, he's asking the question about if, if um, let's just broaden the, the scope of the question rather than just restricting it to uh, people who are diabetic because there are, there are other medical conditions that may restrict people from eating certain foods or uh, regulating them to a certain type of diet. Um, so let's just say that you have a spouse that has a certain medical condition that you know, requires them to eat a certain way. Um, is it the man's responsibility to impose that on his wife or a woman impose that on her husband that they you know, maintain that diet? Is that what you're asking? Or restrict them from certain foods? Would that be their obligation to do that? Um, well, correct. Although they don't want that. Although the, the spouse doesn't want that. Um, imposing things on people, like people don't usually respond well to, to impositions. So I would say that as a husband and wife, if you know that your spouse has a certain diet that they, you know, should, you know, adhere to, that it would probably be better to encourage that. Uh, and at very least, you not contribute to that. So if you're going, if you're tasked with going to the store to buy something that you know the person shouldn't have, you can say, I'm, I'm not going to go to the store and buy that. You know, you, you, you want certain salty foods or foods that are, you know, heavy in sugar and, you know, you shouldn't be eating that. Like, don't, I don't want to participate in that. So don't task me with going to the store to go buy that because I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get that. All right. If you're going to do that, then you do that on your own. I'm, you know, I'm your spouse. The only thing I can do is kind of encourage you in a positive way, in a, in a healthy way to, you know, stick to, you know, your regulatory diet. But if you decide to go beyond that because you just don't want to adhere to that, then, you know, I make dua for you and, you know, I, I, I do my best to advise you. But impositions are usually not, you know, you know you, because they come off controlling. Like you say to your spouse, oh, I, I'm, I'm not buying that or don't buy that or whatever. It's, the person starts to feel like, well, I'm not your child. You know, you don't have a right to restrict me to this or that. You know, and at that point, it's just like, all right, well, you know what happens if, you know, you do that. You know, and I mean, you can have a conversation with them in hopes that they would see your your perspective but i i personally wouldn't Im impose anything on somebody that they don't want imposed on them you know sisters any questions did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ever divorce any of his wives uh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he did divorce his wife he divorced hafsa uh the wife of umar bin al-khattab uh, the daughter of umar bin al-khattab radiyallahu ta'ala anhu um he did divorce uh, Hafsa, and then Angel Jibril came to him and said that Allah commands you to take her back because she fasts all day and prays all night. And he took her back. There was a situation where he divorced Hadith that I believe is in Sahih al-Bukhari where he married the woman. And before um, he could consummate the marriage with her, uh, she said something to him that was offensive and he told her, go home to your family. But he never consummated the marriage with her, so not necessarily considered one of his wives. So there, those are the only two situations that I know of uh, wherein there was a divorce that took place. Yes. Waalaikum <laughs> salam. Someone. What, whose who's, like who's means are, are limited? Yes. It's, okay. um, yeah. And, and um, does that, does he hear me? Well, I, let me, let me explain, let me, the whole 50 50 deal. She's asking, she asked a question as it relates to women uh, of a certain age that want to marry a man of a certain age. Uh, whose means may be restricted either due to he, him only having like maybe one stream of income and maybe that income is just not sufficient or maybe he's retired and doesn't, doesn't have any income at all. What should a sister do given the economic you know, climate that we're in currently? What should a sister do who wants to marry a man but his means are very limited? 
Um, she said, as for the whole 50-50 thing, I don't, I don't think that I can handle that. Well, I don't think any marriage is 50-50. I think every marriage should be 100-100, right? So I think there's certain language that we have to remove from our vernacular in order for us to be able to, you know, transcend this lower level thinking, this low tier thinking that many of us have had for, and I'm saying collectively as a community, as I mentioned earlier about this whole idea of what do you bring to the table? No, what are you willing to sacrifice or what are you willing to pour into the marriage? It's no table, you know what I mean? It's no table. There's you, there's me, and there's our marriage. What are you willing to pull from yourself to invest in our marriage? We have to change the language. Um, so the whole idea of I don't do 50-50, I don't think anybody should do 50-50. I think everybody should do 100-100. If everybody brings 100% of themselves to the marriage, then I think that that marriage has more, stands more of a chance of surviving. If you bring 50% of yourself to anything, that means what we call, as my mother used to say, half ASS, right? And that's 50%. So if you bring in 50% of you to anything, then you're half behind in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I don't I don't I just think that we have to change the thinking. If we bring a hundred percent of ourselves, everything that I have, I'm willing to offer it to this marriage. Um, and you do the same, I think that we'll have a greater chance at being successful. Uh, as it relates to, you know, um, what, a, what a woman should, you know, settle for, what a woman should, you know, uh, what standards a woman should have as it relates to a man and his financial situation, every woman is different. And you have to look at, as I teach my students in the class, what I read from you guys is from my book, uh, How to Get Married and Divorce in 10 Weeks. So what I gave you guys was just a short snippet of what I teach my students in a 10 week course. All right. Um, but what I teach them is number one, to separate your priorities from your preferences. For some women, a man having money is a preference, not a priority because they already have money and they're, they're okay financially. So they're, they're not, they're not necessarily reliant on him for money. So um, her marrying a man that has money is more of a preference for her than it is uh, a priority. And the difference between a preference and a priority is that priority is a non-negotiable, something that you are not willing to negotiate with. Similar to what you mentioned, this whole 50-50 deal, I'm not willing to negotiate with that. that. Then that means that a man coming in of a certain financial status is a priority for you. All right, but not every woman feels the same. There's some women who are well-to-do financially and they don't necessarily rely on a man, although that, that doesn't mean that he is absolved of his financial responsibility. It just means that if he has it or he doesn't have it, it's not necessarily a deal breaker for her. She can find, a, she can find another way to make him carry his weight in a relationship. All right. And it all depends on where you are as an individual. No one can say a person has to be making, you know, when I was an imam and I was, when I was an imam of a particular masjid in, in Philadelphia, uh, the only requirement that I had of the brother who was coming to pursue a sister for marriage is that he had to have a job. I don't care where you work. I don't care where you work. As long as you have a job, because you having a job shows that you have some level of discipline, some level of consistency, and it doesn't matter. I'm not marrying you, so I don't care how much money you make. It all depends on how much she's willing to be okay with. And there are many instances where, you know, the brother discusses, brings up his financial situation. I work here. This is how much I make. And the woman is like, that's fine. I'm okay with that. You can handle this bill or you can handle that until we get to another place. Um, but I'm okay with that. So, you know, to, 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 to set the bar and stay, say that women have to, you know, men have to be making this amount in order for them to qualify for marriage, I think that that would disqualify a lot of people from marriage. And, and, you know, as a general principle in Islam, we should not take something that, you know, can, that can be negotiated with and use that as a standard to deny people access to something that is mandatory like, mar like marriage, especially in this day and time. I think right now marriage should be, we should incline more towards marriage being mandatory, wajib, than anything at this point. Marriage should be wajib. There are five different rulings in Islam. It's called the ahkam al-khams. The five different rulings. There is wajib, mandatory. There's mustahab, there is uh, recommended. There's mubah, which is allowed. Not here or there. 
neither mandatory, neither recommended, but it is allowed. So there's uh, what is wajib, mandatory, what is mustahab, what is recommended, what is mubah, what is allowed, what is makruh, what is hated, and what is muharram, what is haram. Marriage could fall into any one of those five categories depending on the circumstance and situation. But the original ruling that scholars mention about marriage is that it is mubah, it is something that is allowed. But there are circumstances and situations where marriage would be wajib. And that is that if a man or a woman is single, living in an environment where temptations are everywhere and promiscuity and, and uh, indecency and immorality are prevalent, then in these type of, and the person has the ability to get married, then in that situation, scholars say that marriage becomes mandatory. And that is the situation that we are in. We are living in an environment where we are bombarded. This is, they have now done June as LGBT month, pride month. Everywhere you go, whether in Starbucks, whether Nordstrom, Nordstrom has a whole, the, all the windows on Nordstrom is painted in the rainbow. So when you walk in, you are already being welcomed into an environment that welcomes that type of debauchery. And then we have Muslims that will argue and say that, well, it's not mandatory to get married. And living in an environment like this, marriage should be wajib, should be mandatory. It should be a push on all imams from around the board. Imam, students and knowledge should be pushing their communities towards marital education, number one, and then marriage. No longer just pushing people to get married, but to be educated first and then pushing them to get married. That should be mandatory. You know, that's how we safeguard our communities, man. Well, was another question? Then it, uh, hold on. Somebody said, "Did any of the Prophet Sallallahu wives uh, ask for a khuda? No, not that I know of." Go ahead. Someone else had a question. Uh huh. Why didn't you sit down? Yeah. Well, two things, and that's a great point. One is she mentioned um, should the masajid and the imams do um, uh, a, a better job at educating the communities and creating environments where brothers and sisters have an opportunity to meet one another uh, because people are lonely. People are literally in this environment and it just adds to the frustration that people are already experiencing. I just, I mean, just, just imagine you had a horrible day at home, a horrible day at work, and then you go home and there's nobody there that you can actually even talk to, you know, and provided there's some people who are married and can't even go home and share that. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who go home with all of this pent up frustration and, you know, anxiety and pain that they're dealing with. And the hardest thing about pain is holding it in. We get rid of pain by speaking about it, talking about it, having a place to release. And your spouse is one of the greatest ways to release a lot of that. Babe, guess what happened to me today? I'm all ears, honey. What happened? 
man, this happened and that happened. It's like, really? Wow. I'm sorry that happened. You know, and you don't want an answer. You don't want a response. You don't want a solution. You just want somebody to be able to dump that on and get it out of your head, get it out of your heart so that you can wake up tomorrow, you know, with a fresh start. But you go home and, you know, turn on the TV and you're sitting in front of the TV or you turn turn some music on or whatever you do to kind of, you know, calm down or come down, you know, um, convalesce, so to say. And it's unhealthy. In addition to the frustration we are already experiencing, we're also experiencing uh, a state of loneliness. Many in the Muslim community feel lonely, not just because they don't have a spouse, but because they don't have any relationships. You think about COVID, you know, for the past two and a half years, many people have not attended the masjid. I wasn't even in anticipating this many people to come to the masjid today, to be honest with you. I thought I was going to pull in the parking lot and it would be maybe two people here. Fahim, one of them. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, is always here. But, you know, that's, that's what I was anticipating. And so, you know, I'm kind to, I'm trying to reinvigorate, you know, the, the hearts and the spirits of, of the believers to come back out to the communities, man. But, we're lonely. We're lonely. And yes, I do think that the masajid, the imams need to do a better job at creating workshops and creating, you know, uh, seminars wherein people can learn the details of marriage so that we're not just sending people out into the uh, world of marriage unprepared. And then also creating environments within the communities whereby brothers and sisters meet and greets where in a halal space where they can meet each other for the purposes of marriage. Um, these are things that I have been trying to do for years. Um, unfortunately, because of the lack of this, a lot of brothers and sisters are now online and they're no longer using the masjid, but they're doing it in a fashion that is haram. So I would say to the brothers and sisters who are meeting with one another, greeting with one another on social media, that someone needs to take a leadership role in that and organize it in a way where we are abiding by the Quran and the Sunnah in doing that. Not just DMing one another and shooting from the hip and communicating with one another in a manner that is haram or displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But somebody has to take a more leadership role in that and ensuring that parameters are put in place and that brothers and sisters can meet and greet, communicate with one another in a halal environment so that, you know, we have the best of both worlds that, um, but we don't necessarily need to wait for the masajid and wait for the imams to do that. The Many of the masajid, many of the imams have 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 shown us throughout the years that they are completely aloof and that marriage and getting people married is, is the least of their worries. I, I, to me personally, I don't understand what else an imam could be doing. What else could an imam, it takes, I mean, if you've been giving khutbahs on the minbar, it should take you no more than a few hours to put together a khutbah. Shouldn't take you two, three days to, to prepare a khutbah. You're doing something wrong. Should take you no more than an hour or two to choose a topic, pull some ayahs, hadith, and some cultural references, put together a khutbah so that you can get on. Because it's not about the information you prepared. It's more about the delivery. <laughs> it's about how you're going to deliver that information. It can be just a few lines. And you can turn those few lines into an entire khutbah based upon your ability to articulate and your ability to deliver. So if you're not preparing the khutbah, and I'm talking about when you're on the masjid's time. Obviously, imams have families, they have children, so we're not taking that away from them. But we're talking about the time when you are on duty. What else would an imam be doing with his time other than arranging you know, workshops and seminars to educate people about marriage so that we can reduce the amount of bachelorhood and singlehood in our communities? That's our job. Part of my responsibility as an imam was dedicated to reducing the amount of single brothers and single sisters in the community. That's part of your responsibility. And when imams are being hired for this task, the boards of administration need to make that clear that this is part of your responsibility as an imam. Yeah, it's like some of them and, and divorces are normalcy in, in our communities. And that should not be the case. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you. I'm with you. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, great question. 
He said, when we talked about, if we back up a little bit, when we talked about the, the man and the woman at the time of getting married, deciding that they're, they're undecided as to whether or not they're going to give up their apartment or give up their home and move in with the other. So while in that space, they make you know arrangements to this person stays with this person some days, this person stays with that person at their home some days until they decide how they're going to figure that out. Now, in the meanwhile, in the interim, is he still responsible for paying for her home and his home? Uh, obviously, that would be a part of the negotiation process. Until we figure that out, then I'm, I'm not going to pay that. Because as a man, if you're tasking me with providing you with a home, I have a home. Now, if you're not ready to give up your apartment or give up your home because you don't want to move into my place and you're now forcing me to give, that's not the way that that works. That's not the way that that works. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tasked me with providing you with a roof over your head. I have a roof. <laughs> you don't want to move into my place because either you don't feel secure enough, we don't know each other well enough. Okay, well, until that happens, do you expect me to pay your rent? And to pay the rent at the current place where I'm at currently, I, I don't think that that's reasonable. All right. But they do have to find a way to negotiate that. That that has to be negotiated. I mean, however, they decide they're going to fix that. But I would like to think if I have my place, if I have a two bedroom apartment, one bedroom apartment, that's the roof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tasked me with providing you with. Now, if you don't want to move into my place, because of X, Y, and Z, I'm not responsible for X, Y, and Z. I'm responsible for what Allah tasked me with. And that was to provide you with a roof over your head. I have a roof over your head. If that is not adequate for you, then we need to figure out how we can, you know, we can make some arrangements to make that happen. But you can't task me with paying for your home, your mortgage, while I already have a place already of my own that you can move into. You're just not ready to move into. And I, I don't think that that would be fair. I think that would be a bit unreasonable, right? And that all goes to how they're going to negotiate that situation. And here again, at some point, they'll get tired of being in that situation and they'll be forced by necessity to figure it out. They can play around with it for the first couple of months while they're still in the honeymoon phase. It's cute for you to come to my place and stay a few nights and leave some of your stuff at my house. And it's cute for me to go to your house and stay with you a couple of nights at your house and leave some of my stuff. That's cute at the beginning. But when the honeymoon phase wear off and we ready to start getting serious about this, it's like we need to we need to talk. <laughs> yeah, I bet we do. <laughs> How are we going to work this housing situation out? I don't know. Let's let's sit down at the table. Let's let's negotiate. And as I said, the third option for that would be, well, then we both give up our places and we find a place together. But obviously that can't happen until you feel absolutely comfortable with the person. You know, uh, you know you're going to sign your name on a lease with somebody else as a co-signer, whether a home or an apartment in a place where you both you know, choose to do that. There has to be some level of comfort. And that's what I'm saying. Moving in with somebody immediately after getting married, there's, there's not enough comfort there. To do that. And this is especially true or should be especially true with women who have children. You know this man and you only know him after the few sit downs that you have with him across the table. Your children know nothing about him. Your children may tell you a different story. Right. Children don't usually know how to articulate themselves. That's why Allah gave them intuition. So when a child feels your energy and feels, you know, something is off, child may not know how to articulate that they are uncomfortable with you. But you can look at the child's child can read your energy and feel very uncomfortable. And as a woman, I would like to believe that even if you had three, four, five sit downs with this person and you've made a decision to marry him, your children have not made a decision to marry him. And that before you bring this man into your home with all of his bags and your kids are like, Omi, you know, who is this guy? And, you know, oh, this is my new husband. And you're just going to introduce him to your kids like that. I, I don't think that's wise. I don't think that's wise. We've seen and heard too many horror stories, you know, of children, you know, things happening to children by men who have been, you know, invited prematurely to come stay with the woman. All right. So I think that we have to be very cautious, you know, very cautious with that. All right. Before we get to the next question, you talked about um, separating priorities from preferences, mm -hmm. and you gave us a definition of priority, but not preference. 
Okay, so good question. Great to, to make me back up on that. So we talked about priorities and preferences. A priority is something that is a non-negotiable, something that you cannot be in a relationship with the person without. All right, so for some women, financial stability is a priority. All right, for some men, um, you know, being able to produce children might be a priority. Man wants children. So the woman that he's marrying, you know, have you ever had any medical conditions? Have you ever had any miscarriages? Have you ever had any problems with, you know, bearing children? And this is, of course, obviously, if the woman has been married before, or has been in a relationship before. Obviously, if she's a virgin, she would never know that. Right. So um, that might be a priority. This is something that you cannot do without in your marriage. Uh, for some men, uh, marrying a woman who is OK with polygyny might be a priority. That question may come up. Well, how do you feel about polygyny? Uh, I'm not necessarily thinking about going into it right now, but that might be something that I think about in the future. But I don't want to take that off the table. How do you feel about it? She might say no way, shape, form, fashion. The moment you do that, I'm out. All right, cool. May Allah bless you with the husband that you're looking for. I'm cool. I'm good. Because that's a priority for me. At least at the very beginning that we have that conversation and I at least know that, okay, you're not necessarily, you know, you don't necessarily want that. No woman wants that, but we'll cross that path when we reach there. I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. You know, all right, cool. Then we can, we can, we can talk. So these are priorities. These are things that you absolutely have to have in order for there to be a marriage. Preferences are things that you would like to have. These are preferences, things that you would prefer to have. And if the person doesn't have it, it's not necessarily a deal breaker for you. Right. It's not necessarily a deal breaker for you. Like, for example, a woman might want a man who's tall or of a certain build. All right. But the guy that you're sitting with is not. But he's, he has, he checks other boxes. And okay, all right, not necessarily what I would prefer in a guy, but, you know, he meets all of my other requirements and I'm okay with that. All right? Uh, vice versa, a man may uh, prefer to marry a woman who doesn't have any children. All right? But just so happens that the woman that caught his attention, caught his eye, and, you know, he sat down with her. She so happened to have one, two, three children. And he would prefer not to marry a woman with children, but it just so happens that this woman has it, but it's not necessarily a deal breaker for him. You follow me? The difference between preferences and priorities. Uh, and you, you have to separate those two, man, because your priorities are where your expectations come from. When you have something that is a priority, from that priority comes an expectation. And the expectation is that you live up to that priority. That's where your expectations come from. All right. So if you are struggling in your marriage right now because you have certain expectations that are not being met, that is because those expectations are connected to priorities in your marriage that you either didn't prioritize at the beginning or you didn't verbalize as a priority at the beginning. And you have to be very verbal, very vocal about the things that you absolutely have to have in order for this marriage to, to work. For example, a priority would be, you know, no use of profanity in our marriage. I don't curse. I'm, I'm not going to curse at you. I'm not going to call you out your name. And I'm definitely not going to tolerate you doing that to me. That's, that is an absolute priority. Respect is at the top of my list. That don't mean that you can't get angry. You can get mad. You can get upset. I don't, I don't mind. But the way that you communicate that, that's when it becomes problematic. You know, so make that very clear. You know, priorities are things that, you know, are non-negotiable. You are not willing to negotiate with. They absolutely have to be present in order for there to be a marriage. And preferences are things that you would prefer to have. And even though they are not necessarily there, you know, it, it's not a deal breaker for you. Any other questions? A lot of hands went up in the back. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. 
that other women feel like it's what for you? Oh, too early for you. To allow him. Okay, good question. She said that she, let me just reiterate for those of you listening, that she's been married for eight months and her husband uh, is entertaining the idea of taking on another wife and she catches flack from sisters who feel like it's too early for her to allow him to do that. And can I explain to women that polygyny is not something that a woman allows a man to do. It's his right um, Okay, so two things. One is that if a woman says that uh, you allowing him after eight months to seek another wife, uh, that's, their, that's their personal opinion, you know? And even though you may disagree with that, that's fine. Don't steal that from them. Don't take that away from them that, hey, you know, that's your opinion and I, I respect that, but this is my marriage. And if I'm okay with that, I think that that's all that should matter. Um, the, other, the other part here is another another thing that we need to clarify and that is that polygyny is not a right so let's change the language a little bit polygyny is not a right that the man has because when you say that something is a right that means that it is mandatory for a woman to give him the opportunity to do that it's not his right it is an allowance a ruhsa that Islam allows, considering number one, that the man can you know maintain multiple families. There's a certain prerequisite that the man has to meet in order for him to qualify for that allowance. It's just like a person who can shorten and combine their prayers when they're traveling. All right? In order for you to shorten and combine, shortening and combine is not a right. It's an allowance that you qualify for in the event that you are traveling. And if you're sick, you can combine your prayers, but you can't shorten them, right? So for the traveler, shortening and combining the prayer is a ruhsa. It's an allowance. Provided that you are, provided that you are traveling, you meet the, pre, the precondition of traveling, all right? You're leaving your residence and you're traveling. You actually meet the qualification of traveling, which some scholars say is a certain distance or whatever the case may be. Some scholars say it all depends on what people in that locality consider traveling. Nonetheless, you have to qualify for it. Polygyny is the same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put stipulations around polygyny. And one of the main stipulations is that, number one, that they can afford it. All right. Number two is that they have the ability to be fair and be just. And those are two huge qualifications that most of us do not qualify for. Evidenced by the lack of uh, flourishing polygynous relationships in, in our communities. We have polygynous marriages in our communities, but they're not thriving. They're holding on by the skin of their teeth. Simply because one or two or more of the people involved in that situation just don't want to be divorced. And they're just hanging on. But they're not thriving. Other than, because if there were thriving polygynous marriages in our communities, we would, we would not be so ashamed of advertising polygyny in the public sphere the way that we are. We're ashamed because there's a part of us that feels like we're not handling polygyny correctly. When you're doing marriage correctly, you have no worries, no shame, no care in the world what other people think because you know that you are doing right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the only thing that matters to you. But when you're not going about it correctly, you are ashamed. This is why men marry women as second wives, third wives, tuck them away somewhere. Nobody knows anything about them, right? There's, a, there's an embarrassment. There's a shame there because we know that we didn't approach the situation the correct way. So we're ashamed to come out in front because then we subject ourselves to people calling us out on it. You know what I mean? So we, we hide and we tuck it away. You know what I mean? So, but polygyny is not a right. It's an allowance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Muslim men provided they meet a certain criteria in order to qualify for that. So I just wanted to kind of change the language because when you say it's a right, it gives the men this sense of entitlement. Like I am entitled to another wife. 
right? And they are not entitled to another wife. Because the fact of the matter is that the women who are second, third, fourth wives in our communities, if they stuck to their principles of, you know, making the man pay like he weigh, most of us would not have a second wife. That's a fact. The only reason why most of us are in polygyny is because women have lowered their standards for whatever reason. So, you know, just make sure that we check because if we say that it's a right, it gives the men a sense of entitlement. Men have to feel like, OK, this is an allowance in our religion provided I meet a certain criteria and I will work towards meeting that criteria so that I can qualify for the allowance. Not that, oh, I can marry you and in two days I can marry this sister because that's my right. You know, and you can't you can't challenge them on that. You know. One more question. These these are good questions. Since you had your hand up. I'm trying to put it together in my head. This is the last. Okay. Um, in in our society, as you spoke about it earlier, about the LGBTQXYZs. You know, our children are being inundated with this. I mean, it's like in the public schools, I mean, uh -huh. you close the whole school system down to train the, the, the teachers how to address these children and themselves. And it's just it head over heels with uh, what our children are being faced with. Alongside that is the sexualization of everybody's naked, and, you know, young men and young men, young women and young women, how do we find a, um, some kind of balance where our children, if they want to get married at an early how do we support that so that they don't become on this side of the road or that side of the road and we can support them into something that's healthy? Very good question. Very good question. And, and, and she's, let me reiterate the question. She said that we're being, you know, we're being deeply and profoundly, uh, you know, inundated with, you know, this um, phenomenon of the uh, homosexuality, lesbianism, gay, and the, the rest of the, um, the alphabets that represent all of it represents anti-God, because that's all what it is. It's just anti-God. Anything that is ungodly is trapped within those letters LGBTIQ+, right? Anything that is ungodly, just stick it in there and those letters will cover all of it because all of it is designed to be against anything that God legislated and regulated. That's, that's what it is. And we have to see it as that. Don't see it as this is just a movement of gay and, you know, lesbians and people who've, you know, become, you know, sexually uh, deviant, so to say, and that they've decided to take a different path or whatever the case may be. Everything that they represent is anti-God, period. Nothing about what they do, nothing about what they represent is anything godly. And our children are being bombarded with images, uh, um, you know, to the end of it, information. I mean, in public schools, how do we fortify our communities whereby our children can choose the path of marriage and, you know, be supported in that? That has to come from number one. That has to come from home. Our children have to see marriages. Alhamdulillah, throughout the lives of my children, my children don't know boyfriend and girlfriend. They have never been exposed to that in my home. Uh, within my family, you understand? Um, so we, it's the things that we expose our children, obviously going to public school, they're going to be exposed to things, but when they come home, the immediate environment has to be more influential than the external environment. The immediate environment at home has to be, has to have more of an influence on the children than the environment at home, outside of the home. All right. That's so we have to structure our families in a way where they have the exposure they need so that they feel comfortable being Muslim. Right. In their homes, if they're seeing their parents total line, you know, see their parents, you know, teetering, you know, one foot here, one foot there. It sends a message to the children that, you know, I don't necessarily have to be thabit. I don't necessarily have to be firmly fixed and steadfast on my religion. Because I see my mom put on her hijab and then take it off. I see my dad, you know, hanging with non-Muslim friends and going out here and doing this and doing that. And then come back and Jumu'ah, he goes to Jumu'ah. But you're seeing the hypocrisy. 
that is within itself is sending a message to the children that they don't necessarily have to be steadfast. That they can be Muslim in name and then be non-Muslim in practice, you know. So the immediate environment, number one. Once the immediate environment, because you got to think about it. Jewish children, they are experienced, they're exposed to the same thing. But the influence of their Jewish community as well as within their immediate home protects them from going. That's not to say that they are impervious to what, what we see and that they, they don't, some of their children don't go that route. But if we could look from the outside, looking from the outside, it looks like the, the, their religious community as well as their home environment has more of an influence on them than what they see on the outside. It has more of an influence on them than what they see on the outside. And then, of course, there has to be that safety net of the community pushing them. So um, I don't think that we necessarily need to impose on our children to get married. Um, but when they the conversation of marriage comes up, we should be there to supply them with as much information as they need. <clears throat> and to know that if, in fact, they decide they want to go that route, as I told my children, my sons, when you're ready, let me know. When you're ready to have that conversation, let me know. The door is open. So they never feel the need to be ashamed to come to you, to ask you, to inquire. You know, you're always ready to have that conversation with them. And then we talk about marriage. We talk about marriage from the perspective of a responsibility, not just an opportunity to satisfy a desire. Marriage is not about satisfying a desire. It's about taking on a whole family that comes along with that. You know, so having those real conversations with them. But that starts at home. Is is nothing we can do to change the outside environment within our messages, within our immediate homes. Those are the two environments that we have control over. We can control what comes off of the minbar, what we hear in the mosque, in the masjid. We can control that, and we can control what they hear and what they see in our immediate environment at home. Outside of those two environments, we literally have no control over. So that means those two environments have to have the most impact on them has to be most influential on them so that no matter what they see on the outside, they know they can never bring any of that crap back to their masjid or to their home. And, and the whole while that they're putting on makeup and they're doing this to the children, what they don't understand that the, the underlying message is to defy God. That's the underlying message. The underlying message, this is how Shaitan ushers in, you know, the environment that welcomes the Dajjal. Is to totally defy God. Any behavior that is ungodly, we will, we will create it, we'll put a label on it, we'll justify it, we'll create laws, we'll create legislation around it, and we'll practice it openly. That's exactly what this is about. This is not about people being gay, this is not about people being homosexuals or lesbians, this is about people being anti-God, period. Absolutely. I mean, we, we have to broaden our perspective and see it beyond the scope of, you know, what everybody is concentrating on. At least for me, I, I'm, I'm seeing beyond that. It's, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. They want an environment that is completely ungodly. <sighs> Man, we need to put you on a minbar and let you say that. Uh, you know. One, the, she had her hand up and then you, and then that's, that's it. Why they gonna sit up, bud? Can a father advise his daughter to divorce her husband because the husband is overseas for so many years? I wouldn't say advise her to divorce him uh, because I'm sure that there's that, that, that question has so many layers to it. The question is, well, why is he overseas for so many years? Why hasn't you know, anyone reached out to him to have him come back? Does she communicate with him on a regular basis or he just went overseas and just completely abandoned him? She hasn't heard from him in years. If it's a case where he's went overseas and she's abandoned, he's abandoned her and she hasn't heard from him in years and he's gone, never been heard from again, then she should just move on with her life. 
The father, the imam of the masjid can draw up a contract where they can solidify the separation from him and she can move on with her life. Ali bin Abi Talib, anhu, he said anything beyond six months of a man being away from his family, is con she is entitled to tafsakh al-nikah, al which means to dissolve the marriage. Anybody who went out to go fight with Ali bin Abi Talib, the soldiers, he would give them six months and to go back to their families. And if a woman beyond the six month mark asked for the marriage to be dissolved, they would, he would dissolve the marriage because your woman is entitled. Well, no woman is here to sit in limbo to wait around for you to decide to come back. But as a father, he would be more proactive to find out, well, why is this guy overseas? Why isn't he giving my daughter her rights? And then, of course, if he comes to the conclusion that it's just complete abandonment in this guy, then obviously draw up a contract whereby everything is documented and written, written, signed by the imam, signed by two witnesses that this marriage is dissolved based upon, you know, X, Y, and Z. And move, have her move on with her life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah knows best. Last question. Make it count. It's the last last question. So the thing is, um, a lot of the women are getting um, I don't know what's the correct terminology to say, but a lot of the women who are quote unquote as you say boss chicks or like hijabi chicks or like running businesses and stuff like that, um, it's a bad light on us. Um, and I say us because I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know whatever. entrepreneur. Misconstrued, right? Misconstrued, yeah. Thank you. You got me. Um, because a lot of the time, and, and I'm a woman, so a lot of the, the women, we, we don't ask to be put in these situations mm -hmm. as far as running businesses. Right. Everybody for the past two and a half years was in the same situation. Right, right, right. As far as financially. And what I don't understand is, I don't understand how a lot of women with multiple kids, three, four, five, six, Kids, got, a, got a business, go to work, take care of the kids, and they coming out with, you know, businesses. But the men, a lot of the brothers, they don't have their children. A lot of they're not in the home, or they have them on weekends or whatever. Right. And they have more time, and, you know, a lot to them to do whatever, you know, however. And it's like the women are faulted because we, um, came up or we, we utilized our time in a constructive way. In the meantime, in between time, you didn't have the children. You wasn't, you, we got on our breath, our back, our neck, we get everywhere, the bathroom, <laughs> and we got two, three, four business, we, we make it here, we, we sell it, and it's like, maybe from a man's perspective, we won't want to do it, honestly. But it's like, once you're in it, it's a little addiction, yeah, it's you addicted to it, because it's like, oh my God, I get it, this is awesome. But also, the men have not made it comfortable for us to be comfortable Understood. with them running the household. Understood. So it's like, I can't give you, I can't, I can't trust you like that. I, I understand. Because you don't have the understanding of what a man is supposed to do. If I say I need this, I expect you to either go get it, give it to me, or tell me when you're going to have it. Understood. But us have, especially as black women, us having standards, even if it's the standards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for the men in general, it's like we can't have it because, okay, well, she, her, uh, her work goes down, she got two, three, four kids, and let her have five, six, ten, nine, twelve kids. She just, she'd be worthless. And it's just like, there has to be some type of balance. You step in and you remove the burden that she, that she has encountered and but you do it in a way that it's not it's not blameworthy. Right. 
for doing it in a way that's just like, I says, listen, baby, listen, I understand it might be a little hard for you, but I got you. And you can do what you want to do, but you don't have to. And a lot of women don't have that security. Right. Because if, like you said earlier, you might be in my home, but I'm working 12 hours like you're working 12 hours. And you want your bad rights, you want me to cook, you want me to clean, you, want me, you under, don't understand why the kids don't know Arabic, you don't understand why they think that God is everywhere, you don't understand why mm. the, the, the clothes are dirty, but I work like a man. You, and, and a lot of times for the Muslim men, especially African American Muslim men, they have a free workers that, that she got to come with something other than what Allah told me she got to come with. So what do you, like you said, bring to the table? And it's like, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a wife, I keep the secrets, I guard, you know, my chastity, nobody can't come in the house. Nah, 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 sis, that's not enough. What you got financially? And then it's like, what you mean what I got financially? I don't got nothing, I don't, do I have to have it? They don't have that basic understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the, the birth, the, the, the responsibility. And that's really the core of it. Because it's no sisters on the move on as the imam, there's no sisters um, on the, in the, um, you know, the behind the scenes and masjid. There's no sisters opening the masjid doors. There's no sisters closing the masjid door. We behind the men, literally. So the position that we're in is a direct reflection of what our men have us in. I overstand you. But if I let, if I let you continue, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to summarize it. For the people that are, because the people online are like, what is she saying? I well, can't hear, what is she saying? <laughs> let, let me summarize. I, I overstand you, trust me, I overstand you. And I'm going to do my best to, you know, to, to satisfy your, your, your inquiry. So, um, in, in short, <laughs> so what she's saying is that, and it's a, it's a, valid, it's a valid argument, and I, I don't think that I'll be able to do it justice with the little bit of time that we have left, but I, I'll do my best. Um, but it's definitely a conversation that we need to have on a, on a collective, as on a larger scale. And she said that, you know, and we're talking about African-American women here, but African-American women, believe it or not, are, the, are not the only women that this type of behavior uh, is intimidating to men. Arab women are, they, they, they fall into the same category, as well as Desi women. Any woman who looks like she's on the path to some financial stability, success, and she has businesses, and she's an entrepreneur, she's, you know, doing big things. It's intimidating. It's intimidating to a man. Because for a man, a man looks at it like, well, if you're making all of this money and you have all these businesses, then what do you need me for? You, you, you pretty much have it all figured out. So a man always, part of what makes us a man is that, 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 that feeling of being needed. And so when a woman comes off like, you know, I don't need no man, I'm, I'm a boss, and you know, and I, and I say boss hijabi, and I say, but, but I'm speaking about a particular type of woman who comes with a particular type of mindset from amongst the Muslim women. I'm not talking about all women who are entrepreneurs, because all women who are entrepreneurs do not conduct themselves like I'm a boss. I'm, I'm, I'm giving off the same energy as a man gives off. You know what I mean? Like they're not giving off masculine energy. They're still as feminine. They can still find their, they can still find their place within the marriage, whatever that place is that makes them comfortable in that space and still allow a man to lead without infringing on, you know, his role, his responsibility. Those are not the boss hijabis that I'm talking about. The boss hijabis that I'm talking about are the women who flaunt you know, their business acumen, they flaunt their entrepreneurial, you know, endeavors as if to say that me and a man is on the same level and I don't necessarily need you. And if I do accept you as my husband, then you got to play the role that I give you. That, that's what I'm talking about. And no man is going to be OK with that. Men, part of what makes us inclined towards a woman is when a woman, why do you think men always go after the woman who's a damsel in distress? Not that they go after them, but it gives us that sense of, you know, that feeling of being the guy, the super guy, the guy that's going to come in and save. That's just part of our nature as men. We're hunters. We're hunters. And, and when a woman shows that she respects and she get out your way and let you hunt, that is what makes us feel more like a man. When a woman is running alongside us hunting, you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to go over here for this. this. She looked like she need help over here. I'm going to go over here. You know, 
I, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. That's, you know, men, we just want to feel like we're needed. And when a woman has money, she has her own place, she has her own car, she has her own everything, and she's doing big things by herself. There's, there are men that feel like, well, what does she need me for? It seemed like you're doing a pretty good job of that all by yourself. You don't need me. Because me walking into that situation, only one or two things is going to happen. Either um, my energy and your energy are going to synchronize and, you know, we're going to grow together. Or I'm going to come in and have to take a more subordinate role because this is who you are. This is who you've fashioned yourself into being uh, given, you know, all of the circumstances that you mentioned as, a, as you mentioned earlier. And here again, for, for the brothers that are listening... She said that women are sometimes forced into these situations. And the, the point that you mentioned about COVID and those two and a half years that we were dealing with, yes, a lot of women, and I applaud you guys for that, a lot of women cultivated themselves within those, those two and a half years that we were homeschooling and home. Women found their niche in that moment. There are a lot of women, I ain't going to call out no names, but there are a lot of women that I know on social media right now who have thriving businesses right now as a result of what happened during COVID. And I applaud you for that, you know what I mean? But that still does not take away the intimidation that men experience when they see you from the outside. You know, obviously they would have to get to know you to understand that who you are as a businesswoman does not define you as a woman. All right. But that takes for him to kind of, you know, deal with his own insecurities and be able to meet you at the table head on and hear you out and be able to see you. But there's a lot of men that would opt for a woman who is not like that and because they don't they don't want to risk putting themselves in a situation where they feel inadequate or they feel, you know, invalid. You know, so it is intimidating. And these are the things that you have to understand is more it's the same as a woman you know, climbing the academic ladder. You know, you got your bachelor's degree, you got your master's degree, and now you're going for your PhD. Once you hit PhD status, you are in a rank with other women or in a pool of other women that, you know, many men are not checking for. And it's, it's really sad because while we push our women to remain chaste and to remain righteous and to get your education, we push you so hard to do these things. And then when you do them, there's only a small pool of men that you can actually choose from. And it's, it's, it's really sad, honestly. That's why when you were talking, I'm like, I overstand you. You know, I have a daughter and I'm, I'm pushing her to get her education. I'm pushing her and I'm alongside of her. But I, in the back of my mind, I do know. But the privilege that she has is that she has a father who is out and active in the community. And she may have a luxury that other women don't have. And that is that a father who knows many brothers who could possibly link her with somebody of her caliber. But many women don't have that. So now you graduate with your PhD and you're looking around for, you know, an equal partner, you know, so a man with a PhD, a brother with a PhD. And he's like, man, he's not checking for you. Or not even a brother with a PhD, but just someone who was just halfway decent, you know, but he's not checking for you. And, and that is the, the, the paradox of, you know, becoming successful is that the more successful you come, the more lonely you become. And the thing is, is that it's the same thing for men. That the, the men, we are not impervious to that. You think a brother who, you know, goes to an Islamic university, graduates with a degree or whatever, while he can choose from any woman he wants within the Muslim community, he doesn't want every woman. There's a specific type of woman that he's looking for, and that woman rarely exists in our communities. He'd be hard-pressed like finding a needle in the haystack. So men are not impervious to that either. You know, while women... The, the extra burden that you guys have, as you mentioned, is that along with all of that, you have children. So not only are you forced by necessity to work because the father of the children is not contributing at all or not contributing substantially to help lessen some of the burden. You got to actually put, you know, your cape on and you got to go out there and be superwoman. So you're, you know, while many men are celebrating Father's Day today, there are many women who are celebrating Father's Day today, too. And that's a fact. Because there are many women who are playing both roles in today's time. And as she the mother and the father. Because the father ain't doing nothing. So while he's sitting around smoking a cigar later on tonight with his boys. Talking about, you know, happy Father's Day and patting each other on the back. Dude, you ain't seen your children in months. You ain't seen your children in eons. You don't get to pop a cigar in your mouth and pat each other on the back and talk about happy Father's Day. You don't even deserve that title. 
that title should be given to the to the mother of your children because she's more of a father than you are. And I mean, but that's 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 the reality of it. I mean, this and part part of the reason that you can contribute to part of this mindset, even within the Muslim community, you can thank Kevin Samuels for that. Because this was one of the things that he was that this is what he was contributing the part of. And I'm not saying that all of what he said was wrong, but part of what he did was to, as you said, a woman who has a certain amount of children, she is just almost like an invalid. She doesn't even count. Right. 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 Yeah. This is the mind. This is the mindset that he was feeding. He was feeding that mindset. Okay, so we have to wrap this up. This is definitely a conversation that needs to be continued. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakumallahu khayran. Wa sallallahu ala nabidu Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama taslima kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.